All righty. Good morning. Welcome to this edition of At The Mic. I'm your host, Keith Malinak. It is Saturday morning, March 23rd, 2024. And uh, we're rocking and rolling here, about to begin our 12th, uh, 12th of 12. See, when you say, when you, when you can't decide if you want to say 12 or 12th, you end up saying 12th. Anyway, so here we are, part 12 of 12, and the uh, Saving Disney History um, series that Ed McRae has just done a fabulous job with uh, as he um, really pulls back the veil of the history of the Walt Disney Company, and he has been um, just giving us an education on where things have gone wrong and, and it's ha- for the company, and, and many at many points along the way, it's gone wrong. And so it's gotten us to where we are today. And uh, hopefully uh, they can course correct over there at the Walt Disney Company and learn their own history as Ed is teaching us. Uh, I want to make sure if you're unaware, uh, there's my Twitter handle there. See that right there? Keith Malinak pinned to the top every day for the next couple of weeks. We're doing a little tournament uh, in honor of March Madness. It is the worst presidents of all time. If you would like to go and vote every day, there is a new contest. Uh, Woodrow Wilson and Franklin Roosevelt have already advanced to the second round. And so there's many other games pinned to the top there at Keith Malinak every day. Uh, Yesterday, we did a live stream with uh, my buddies uh, Brad Stagg and Jack Helmuth. If you check that out uh, here at youtube.com slash at the mic with Keith. And then next week, we have another one with my buddies uh, Ian Patterson and uh, J.P. Decker, uh, and I think you'll enjoy hanging out with them as well. All right, enough of that stuff. Let's get Ed in here. Professor, good morning. Welcome. I appreciate you making time <laughs> yet again. Man, we've been hanging out every Saturday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern since uh, late December. Yeah, it's going to be sad you... now. <laughs> oh, well, no, but see, I want, I want you to tell everybody um, in fact, we should, you know what, while I'm thinking of it, you tell everybody the name of, uh, of your, uh, web address that you just well, uh, came up with because people need to go in because when we're done talking today, this will be the last edition of this 12 part and go to the playlist, check out any, uh, episodes that you've missed, but Ed's going to keep going and, and sharing this important history and preserving this important history over at what is the website? rediscoveringwaltdisney.com and there's links to all the social medias I registered and the only one I've really moved into is the Rumble channel and I've got a lot of the historical clips there. Did I get that? Did I spell that right? rediscoveringwaltdisney.com oh, I keep mistyping it too, so don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> rediscoveringwaltdisney.com So that's where you can follow along with Ed and um, obviously follow Ed over on Twitter as well uh, at real underscore Ed underscore McRae. Sir, take it away. <laughs> Floor is yours. Well, we were we left off last week with Floyd Norman. I know you wanted to get to spend some time with Floyd. Yeah, I do and like Floyd. F- Floyd's really the only one around now who's the keeper of the history because he was there. Yeah. He yeah. started he started in uh, 1956 and he worked on Sleeping Beauty back then. He did, wow. Was, yeah, that's how long he's he, well, he's not there now, but he's he goes back sure. that far. Uh, he worked on 101 Dalmatians and Sword of the Stone. Then he got drafted into the military to go to Korea. And in the background, there you can see he's working on Sleeping Beauty. Yeah. Um. And uh, <laughs> how many? How many? How many artists do you think over the years have uh, been tasked with uh, officially drawing Mickey Mouse for for Walt oh, Disney stuff? I'm not sure, but I, that does remind me of something we never mentioned when they were first doing Mickey's. How they would get the scale, they would draw a quarter and a dime to do the ears and the head. And that's how they, all the way back oh. in the silent era. And that's why he's yeah. shaped the way he is. <laughs> they, that was quarter the and two dimes. Yeah. That is incredible. I love that. <laughs> now, this is when, after Floyd, after Walt died, Floyd went and he started his own little company there. I'll get to that here. Let me, I'll get caught oh, up okay. here. Sorry, um, sorry. No, that's, that's ahead, okay. Y'all. <laughs> that's okay. How Floyd got into the story department was... He was always drawing cartoons of the co-workers and he'd hang them on the billboard outside his office, built and board. And people would walk by and see him. And Walt always walked through the studio when no one was there. So he knew what everything, everything was going on. He would go through the, the employee's garbage and see what gags they'd thrown away. And he sometimes he'd put them back and tell them, don't throw away your good stuff. <laughs> and so, so Walt put him on the Jungle Book 
to because of these cartoons he was hanging. We'll show some similar cartoons a little bit, but you remember last week we had J uh, uh, Jack Kinney. He was doing cartoons of the co-workers years after the fact, but they would do that when they were contemporarily working there. Mm -hmm. And he's the one that's kept that alive because no one does it today because you have all the HR people that get offended and everything. And uh, that, so he's a keeper of the flame of that as well. And when he got, he got put on the Jungle Book because originally the Jungle Book was a darker version. Bill Pete had set that up and it was more true to the book. And Walt looked at it and he said that this looks like Batman. <laughs> and he oh, wanted wow. he wanted it lightened up and he put Floyd in there. And, and Floyd, he worked on the scene with Kai. He did the story parts of it. Uh, there was the, the King Louis and everything. Louis mm -hmm. Armstrong wanted to be King Louis. And yeah. for some reason that didn't work out. Floyd told me this. And Louis Prima is King Louis. And Louis Prima is Italian. And you know, today all the woke people try to say that the, the monkeys and the apes are black people. Mm -hmm. No one thought of that at the time. It's, it's just people, it's always the woke people that come up with this stuff. Right. And if Louis Armstrong had been King Louis, they would have probably gone nuts on that. They go crazy on the name being similar. And King Louis is from the actual book. That's the character's name. I mean, the, the movie is different than the book. <laughs> But so they, they okay, I see. So they just try to say that it's that when yeah. they don't even realize that uh, Louis Armstrong actually wanted to be, yeah, he, and he had a history of, of performing in Disneyland. Uh -huh. And, and uh, he had a oh, he had a, several albums we showed before where he sang songs that were Walt Disney songs, Disneyland songs. And what another thing that's interesting with Jungle Book that was written in New England that he was uh, Kipling was on vacation in the united states and he wrote that in a winter up in uh, new england i forget which state if it was vermont or hmm. yeah but uh, they don't like kipling because of colonialism now anyway but no you're right it, yeah. and there's been a history some history books about the jungle book film and they have to put all this stuff in there about kipling and colonialism and everything it has nothing to do with anything just people reading into it but the jungle book was really the the film that he really uh took off on in the story department um and uh, he ha has a couple of stories here about Walt. One of them, I can't, couldn't find the cartoon, but he drew this cartoon. He had it online years ago where they had the donuts for the employees and he t he ate Walt's donut and Walt wanted to know where his donut was. And Floyd went around the corner and quickly ate the donut or a muffin. I can't remember which it was. And the other story he always tells about Walt is uh, this old lady showed up at the, at the Disney studio one day in a, a horse and buggy. And she had written a script that she wanted Walt Disney to read. And the guard in the gate at the gate was arguing with her that Walt was busy, didn't have time for it. Walt heard about the commotion. He went down to the front gate and he talked to the woman and he took the script and he said he would read it. And he did. And I don't know what that script was, but uh, he happened to see Floyd walking along on the way back. And he said, the world is full of peculiar people. That's what Walt told Floyd. But that really impressed Floyd that Walt would do something like that when most executives they would have just <laughs> sent the woman on her way and but that's funny and and floyd's always saying how he's walt was an ordinary man uh ultimate conservative man and, and uh he just had progressive ideas but it's not the same as what progressivism means now mm -hmm. um he uh he what he ended up doing was he listened <laughs> he let he let these are some of the drawings that he does these drawings and he uh he like commissions and sells them and things. Oh, and uh, cool. it's, it's a, his, he posts them on Facebook. He's a good follow. He sometimes po writes articles and things on different websites. He did the original fat Albert. He left Disney after Walt passed away and he started up a studio and they did uh, let me get everything he did. It was called vignette films. And his business partner was Leo Sullivan. And they produced six animated short films on black history. And I've asked Floyd where these films are. Cause I would love to see them. And uh, he doesn't know, but uh, they, did, they did Fat Albert. And he, when uh, Bill Cosby was in trouble, he had nothing positive to say about Bill Cosby, how they were wow. treated working on that. Wow. And uh, when when uh, he came back to work on Robin Hood, and uh, if you remember Robin Hood with the, the animals, mm -hmm. and then uh, he left again. He worked for Hanna Barbera for 10 years. Then in the 80s, he came into the, the Disney comics and he uh, took over the Mickey Mouse strip. And he did, worked on that till the Eisner people decided to shut it down. So and, wait a minute. I, I don't know if it was just because I grew up in Atlanta, but I didn't realize until this moment that there was, there was, was there a Sunday morning 
Um, it was it was daily comic. and uh, Sundays, but it, it was only in, in a few papers when we were kids. I didn't know yeah. about it either. But oh. it was it was it went continuously all the way back when Floyd Godfordson started it in the in, when Mickey was first created in 1928. Huh. And cool. I, the strip card started in 29, but Floyd carried it on. He had to re, uh, retire the strip, and some of the executives thought that he, it was the same Floyd that worked on the strip from the beginning <laughs> to the end. So that was kind of that just talks about how the executives are. Um, when Disney shut down the 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 comics, he got into the animation department again. He worked on the Hunchback of Notre Dame, Mulan, Dinosaur, a Tigger movie, and he also worked on uh, that wildlife project we talked about that got shut mm -hmm. down. And in his book that I showed last week, he tells that same story why it was shut down with all the. Uh, the sexual innuendo with the rainbow jihad stuff he even has the same right. line in here. And I didn't know about that. When I told that story, I got told that by somebody else that was there, but that, that it collects a lot of his uh, articles in, in book form where he talks about his career and everything. And if you have a kid in, in college or high school, that's going into animation, it's pro it's a good book to get for what it's like now. And, and, and what is it called again? It's called an animated life. And it's by Floyd Norman. There's also a documentary that tied in with this. I don't have a copy of that, but it was on uh, Netflix at one time. I will hope it comes back or they sell it again. And he goes through his whole life and everything on it. I only saw so, it once. So when we were scrolling through here, I saw him posing with the Monsters, Inc. Yeah, I was characters. just going to get to that. He's I was just going to ask. Yeah, yeah, so he was involved with that? Yeah, he came up with the title. Huh. I oh, think cool. or, or it was either him or it was uh, uh, Joe Grant. I forget now. It was one of the two that were all the way back from Walt, though. Uh, he they, he was the only person who's worked for Walt Disney and uh, John Lasseter. Okay. And he was there on Toy Story 2 and Monsters Incorporated. And uh, D Disney let him go when he turned 65 because they have a rule on how old you can be working there. What is and, that? Yeah. And he's still, he's uh, 88, 89, something like that. And he's still just as sharp as, you know. Mm hmm I mean, he, I, he's a, still got a lot of wisdom, good story person. If you read his articles, he doesn't buy into all this uh, victimization stuff. His book talks about that, about how you, when you get thrown things in life, you have to overcome them and not be a victim. Mm -hmm. And he even will point out he, he doesn't like, and I don't like to say it, he doesn't like to think of himself as being the first black animator. He was just an animator looking for a job and he was talented and there. Had nothing to mm -hmm. do with his race that he got the job. And he's, he just he praises how Walt treated him. He, he always says Walt was like a crotchety old guy. like his, uh, and He reminds him of his grandfather. And when he draws Walt, we'll see into the folder here, he always draws him that way. But I just love seeing Walt drawn that way. Um, he's always defending <laughs> Walt to this day. And uh, he, he's, he, he, you know, like we talked about, he went on The View and everything. He yeah, always... yeah. Mentioned that though. Uh, I don't know if a lot of people are familiar that we mentioned it briefly previously, but uh, Floyd Norman went on the View. I don't know for the Jungle Book. Ten... For the Jungle Book, okay. And and as part of the interview, they tried to goad him into telling the world that Walt Disney was racist, and he absolutely said not at all. Right, something to that yeah, effect. Yeah. I remember seeing the and... clip. Well, in the clip that's on YouTube of that, it's edited down to like five minutes, but the original version was like 15 or 10 or something like that, because there were things that I remember in it that aren't on the YouTube version. And mm -hmm. he told them what he thought, and and Whoopi Goldberg wants to merchandise those crows, and uh, Floyd uh, likes all these things like that. He, he knew the animators that did them. He knows they weren't racist either. Mm -hmm. And like the crows, they were done to... Uh, they, 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 the voices were actually black actors and some of them were in song of the South and Ward Kimball filmed them and they all, they love being filmed and everything. And uh, I love looking at the books on his desk there too. And uh, right. yeah, you know, I always do that with people's photos and things, what, what they're reading. <laughs> and uh, that's awesome, man. Get, get some of the Disney books that I don't have. Uh, he uh, he talks about why we shouldn't censor these things. People were just trying to make things to be funny. They weren't trying to make documentaries on how thing life was back then. And uh, he he uh, look at that. That's cool, man. Oh, that's, he, that, and he's in the background there. If you you notice, that's his self portrait. <laughs> uh -huh. um, 
he, he he's just totally against censoring these. This is when he these are some of the cartoons when he uh, what happened in his career. He, you know, you get kicked out of one place and go to another. That's some of the artwork he did for both films, Hunchback and Jungle Book. And he's aware we're doing these, and that's what he had to say about it. He thanked me for doing these shows. And when uh, Pete, when can I read Pete, this out to everyone? Yeah, yeah, yeah go ahead. I asked right. him a question that someone had brought up about uh, uh, Sidney Poitier saying that, uh, or they said that he's the one that suppressed Song of the South because he was the first black actor to win a competitive Oscar. And he was supposedly on the board of Disney. And Floyd never heard that before. But wow. I see so people he says, repeating that now. He says, thanks, Ed. Your efforts are certainly appreciated, although I hardly think I'm the one to accept the award on Disney's behalf. Uh, then again, I'm afraid there's no one else left to accept. I was just a kid when the Disney company released Song of the South. It made such an impression on me. I still find it amazing how so many garner such a negative message from such a positive film. Uh, you might find it somewhat interesting that my favorite venue for showing Song of the South was a sweat box on the second floor of Walt's animation building. And they called the, the, the sweat box. That's where they showed uh, the dailies of the films. And they called it the sweat box because you were always there dreading what Walt would say about it. So you were sweating. <laughs> That's how it got its name. Uh, and uh, there was a documentary that PBS did a few years ago. It was like four hours long about Walt Disney. And all it was was a hit piece smear on him. And Floyd was, they always interview Floyd because he knew Walt. But the way they edited it, they just focused on all these things that aren't true and negative things. And he really called them out on that. And I've seen some uh, introductions to books on Walt. He's talked about that how people want to paint Walt as this evil, rotten guy, and that's not who he knew, and it's just not true. And he also, when the movie Soul came out from Pixar, I remember reading, he did a post online, he thought that was a very racist film, the way I, the story oh, wow. is on that and everything. And uh, he doesn't really bring in race into things. He's just, it's how it used to be in America. And... Uh, I, I we need more of that, and I, I I wish he would get more attention while he's here with us and tell his stories like in a formal way. I mean, he should be on one of your shows or Glenn's show or something. <laughs> yeah. You know, no, the, I, the weekly I, show. <laughs> yeah, whenever there is, uh, you know, as history begins to fade away from its caretakers, and you start to really sit up and take notice of those who are left. Yeah, you're absolutely right, man. You gotta amplify their voice and and make sure that their history and their story is told um what and, folder do you want me in next oh, oh, there's sir? one that, i think it's called the gag folder it's in the Floyd okay folder. that's what i thought these here. are some okay. of the cartoons that and some of them are in his books he's got several books with just cartoons they're more for hardcore animation people and a lot of these were posted online but i wanted you to get an idea of his kind of humor and what it's like in the animation business you contrast this with the jack kinney stuff we did last week uh-huh no, you, you can start with the grumpy waltz. I put them at the beginning. Uh huh. And there they are pitching a pitching an idea to him in the in the theater, right? Well, yeah. You're, you're not. Show, it's not showing up though on the screen. Oh shoot! I'm sitting here <laughs> just enjoying these pictures all to myself, y'all, and and just uh, loving them. Boy, there's some good stuff in there, and maybe I'll share. Maybe I won't. Uh, okay. This was about Walt aging when, when he starts out in the 30s and how he ended up when Floyd knew him. And it is first true. That is... <laughs> first day here, y'all. All right, there we go. There we go. So that that, that looks familiar from a, a recent uh, episode. That's that's like the pitch meeting, right? Yeah. And then... Uh... And he would drum his fingers and people didn't like yes. that. He, he did that all the way back into the 1930s. That's one of his traits he always had. <laughs> there it is. There it is. <laughs> and that was something that was also drawn by Jack Kinney. And he always has a cigarette in, in a lot of these. So Right. This is terrible. Who did this? Yeah. <laughs> and this was the, the story with that one there with the, the jam. They were in a jam session. They were late coming back to lunch and Walt told them to get back to work. This uh, here was they were having trouble with uh, uh, Winnie the Pooh, how to adapt it. And so <laughs> they, the joke was Walt was going to send him back to England. They they couldn't even decide how to do Winnie the Pooh's hands. That they, if he was gonna have fingers or no oh. fingers or just he ended up with a thumb and a and a end there. Right now, this is in, from one of Floyd's books. He got into a fight with the unions, and I can relate <laughs> to that too. And uh, you, if you can, re, you want to read? Yeah, that. it says if if Floyd doesn't pay his union dues, we're gonna let Hanna Barbera ship more shows out of the country. 
And that's a fight that I would get into with the union people myself. And this is for oh look from at the that 80s with the, the black, black cauldron. cauldron, and we and this is the NAACP, the National Urban League, and <laughs> Core saying we find the title of your new film offensive. Wow, you know and that goes back all the way. Then. Yeah, that's interesting because you feel like that's almost uh you know everything everything's racist. Everything's yeah. racist. You think that's only a, a phenomenon in the era of political correctness? Twenty, thirty years. My gosh, when when did the Black Cauldron come out? Nineteen eighty-five. Okay. All right. Well, and yeah. and uh, something else about that. Uh, Floyd always points out how Disney did the Tarzan movie, and it's set in Africa, and there's not a single black person in it. <laughs> Interesting. Because <laughs> they're afraid they were afraid to offend people, and right. stuff, you know, and that's supposed to be Michael Eisner with Frank Wells, mm. and uh, he did a lot Frank of uh, cartoons. He did a lot of cartoons. That's Michael Eisner with his money in his pajamas. Good and stuff. he was he was a rebel. Now I love this one. <laughs> uh, remember when queens used to be the villains in Disney movies? Now they're the guys we work for. And that was in the 90s. Mm. That's reinventing Walt. This is when they were they did touchstone pictures and got an R rating. <laughs> <laughs> what the f? That's good. Huh. And that he draws Mickey like that and calls it Rat Boy, or he hmm. did. I don't know if he does now, but he would do these online for years. And then, uh, <laughs> didn't that used to be the Walt Disney Studios? Boy, ain't that the truth? And th these are ones that he he printed this book in the nineties that that one came from. Now that's Michael Moore when they were doing Fahrenheit. Uh, 9 11. Uh huh. And that's Eisner. <laughs> uh, and this is coming up. That's Wooly Reitherman, who was in our first at Legends show. And there's Walt on his cloud in heaven. And he says, uh, What the hell's going on down there? I told you to keep an eye on things. And the guy, uh, Wooly Reitherman's like, Oh, gee, Walt. <laughs> and then this is, a, these are actual things that the executives would come up with in the early 2000s. They, they've, Trying to come up with a film with what Disney films are going to be. The musicals are a sure bet. Action and Walt says, You don't think they've ever seen a Disney film before? This is when Eisner had his heart attack, and that's oh, Frozen God. Walt, and they're hauling him out. <laughs> uh, Eisner's which doing is, okay, put him back. Which you debunked um, in a previous yep. episode as a joke among the crew. They started Ward, that rumor. Ward Kimball started that. Yeah. Let's see. What's this say here? It's like printing money. We do knockoffs of our own library and ship production yep. offshore. And that's when uh, they were doing all the direct-to-video sequels. And I call them cheap uh -huh. pools. And John Laster shut those down when he came in. Now, these are the new ones with uh, George Lucas and Star Wars. He's, he's had online. <laughs> now, George, look, to set the, George Lucas went on uh, PBS, and he called uh, Disney white slavers for what they did with uh, Star Wars. But then this week he recently endorsed Bob Iger. So, yeah, there you go. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and we're signing for to, to Iger, uh, and that's the white slaver thing again. <clears throat> No more script ideas, okay? You, you know what his script idea was they didn't want to do, right? I don't. I don't think I do. His so, idea for the talk, sequel... You're talking about uh, George, George Lucas. Lucas. Okay, his, gave an idea to Disney. His, his uh, idea for the, the sequel was going to be in a microscopic world where the force and everything works, like the... It, in the... the uh, Ant -Man. It's Ant-Man. The original movie, the, the or the episode one, not the original movie, episode one, The Phantom Menace, they had that metachlorian thing. And he was going to make them into characters or something called the Wills. And this this term, the Wills, goes all the way back in the 70s because he, when he did the original Star Wars script, it's called something like it came from the testimony of the Wills or something. And uh, that stuff's just too hardcore for mainstream audiences. <laughs> hardcore sci-fi. Okay, interesting. It, it, well, it, the Star Wars was successful. So One of the reasons they say it was successful, George Lucas' wife was an editor and she found the movie in editing. And she said when she saw the, uh, episode one, she sat in the parking lot of the... They were divorced by then. She sat in the parking lot and cried in her car what her ex-husband did to Star Wars. Oh, wow. 
that came out a couple of years ago. She said that. <clears throat> yeah, that's a good one too. Chewy, we're home. This is Disneyland. This is about paying for the schools and stuff for animation. Because when Floyd was there, people, a lot of those old timer guys, they didn't go to art school. They just came up through and now they want you to have degrees and be uh, certified in this and that. And they invented the business. Wow. This one, uh, you know, kid, I've been from one end of this studio to the other and I've seen a lot of weird stuff. White slavery. That's a lot of superstition and nonsense. That's supposed to be Iger saying that, but it's the line that Han Solo said. Uh-huh. Yep. Uh, let's see. George, you'll not find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. You must be cautious. <laughs> how he's doing. Uh, it's good stuff. So he's still he's still drawing uh, what, what, up, up to he, today, huh? Yeah, he still draws today. Now, this is Mickey and Donald, this parody of them. I think he calls it Duck Man and Rat Boy. Um, <laughs> he, what he ended up doing after they, they kicked him out is he just started showing up and he would drew, do drawings there in the studio. And I, in the documentary, it goes into that. I can't remember how it goes. This is where he gets fired. He's eating a Mickey on an island with, uh, like, Survivor. And that's I, I took that out of his book. Uh, he... Uh, he uh, just started showing up and he would work at his desk there till they gave him a desk. And he, it's, he called it, they, people called it floitering. This is when they, <laughs> they fired him. And he, yeah, after 30 years, I walked out of, of Disney one Friday afternoon and it was fun while it lasted. And that's how he felt. The people were, the management was treating him when they, when he left. <sighs> Okay. And I think the next folder there, it's it's not a Disney film, but it's one of these films that's banned today. It's a Looney Tune I've talked about, but this is what uh, Cole Black looked like in the in Cole the Seven Black. Dwarfs. And uh, to set up what this was again, people black people started writing Bob Clampett at Looney Tunes and asked him why aren't there any black Looney Tunes? And he didn't know why. He thought that was a great idea, so he made a couple. And this was the first one. And it's not a race cartoon. It's really a war cartoon, World War II mm -hmm. cartoon. And it's on the official list. There's, there were 11 cartoons that were banned by Warner Brothers, and this is one of them. All of the dwarves are caricatures of famous black actors at that time. Okay. And they're, they're just as caricatured as Walt's seven dwarves. They're just black actors. And uh, it's one of these infamous cartoons, but there's not really anything other than the caricatures. There's not really anything in it. But that, that's what the castle looked like in a storyboard. Oh. for it um and it's and it used to make the uh, top 50 lists of the greatest cartoons ever made that's all the cast of characters there the the queen Can was called the queenie anywhere are they on youtube i mean is there... sometimes people put them on youtube sometimes they're on the internet internet archive i'll have to add it to our links there okay but yeah don't forget links uh in the description shortly after uh, we're done here but uh, that's wow. one of those things that's banned and some of these uh, people now that want to ban song of the south these historians and gatekeepers and things they were going to release uh, cole black a few years ago but once the word got out about all this woke stuff they mm -hmm. got on board of censoring everything and yeah. cole black is probably if it's offensive it's more offensive than anything in song of the south there's no real caricatures of anything in song of the south and uh that's just another example of how things have changed now this floyd worked on some of these now, this was a, in 1960, they started doing a Christmas comic strip. And it went from 1960 to 1987, and it was called Disney's Christmas Story. Then it uh, was, the name changed to Disney's Holiday Story. That's there it is. Eisner took over. And uh -huh. it ran a panel every day between Thanksgiving and Christmas. And it would count down. I remember these in, uh, when they started with Beauty and the Beast. And uh, this is the first example I have, was aware of where something got censored because in 1986, Floyd did one. It was uh, Br'er Rabbit's Christmas. Uh -oh. And uh, <laughs> well, well, a few years ago, 2016, they printed, it's, this is supposed to be the complete collection. And not only is that one strip not in here, they erased it from the historical section that it ever existed. Uh -huh. It just skips over that year and goes to 1987. And the info, the articles were the article near where they quote uh, Floyd. He talked about that song of the South strip in that article. So they did this deliberately. 
and it they d deliberately erased it. And I would like to find that whole strip online somewhere, all the little strips, and put it together so people can see it because the, it's people would like to see that. And sure, it's not in the official book. And uh, it, it they try to say it's complete, and it's not. I, I remember these when I was a kid. They would just be in the newspaper every day between Thanksgiving and Christmas. It would tell a different story. This one was about they were going to give toys to the children of Agrabah. And the Sultan, if you remember from the movie, he collects toys. And that was what the the, the solve, solving of the problem was. And that's the, what the book looks like, that they erased the Song of the South strip that ever existed. But it, it did exist. That's one of the strips for that one, the Zippity-Doo-Dah Christmas. And uh, I wonder if you could find this on one of those newspaper archives or mm. Ancestry.com, because that's where some of these come from. Oh, wow. I, I'm not a member there, but I would just go through and collect all of these. And because that's that there is Disney history that's been erased. And F Floyd uh, made the case for this. He played uh, the film for a black audience in a church and they loved it so much. They wanted to watch it again. And they did an encore because he oh, had to wow. prove to Disney that it wasn't an offensive film. And this is around the time where they were building uh, Splash Mountain. So next up, you talk about offensive. Here we go with oh, Uncle Remus, right? Now this is this is the, this is one of our holdovers when we had the characters. Okay. Show. Now people don't know this, but Uncle Remus and his Tales of Bear Rabbit. It was a comic strip in the newspapers from 1945 until 1972. It's almost 30 years. This was in the newspaper, and it's been erased from existence. And it was in Sundays as well. And uh, it replaced. There was a Silly Symphony strip before this, and this replaced it. And the story all, all the, always ends with Uncle Remus giving a bit of wisdom from the moral at the end. And uh, there was a reprint series announced a, a few years ago, like 2019. And this is when the woke stuff come through. And Floyd had written an introduction for it. And Disney pulled the plug. <laughs> and they the, the printer, the company that was going to print this, they tried to get uh, Disney to change their mind. Floyd tried to get them to change their mind. And they wouldn't do anything. They wouldn't budge. And I have the cover of that in the, the folder here. But uh, that this goes back to that Christmas comic book. You know, it collects all the comics of the Christmas comics. That was the first time anything got erased from existence from the history. And now look what they've done. They've tore down, tore down Splash Mountain. Now they won't let a reprint of the entire uh, comics to happen. And I don't understand. If you don't want to see it, don't buy it or don't read it. <laughs> it's uh, it's pretty simple, isn't it? Ed? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, and uh, I I don't understand this whole no whole idea that characters have to uh, you have to read yourself in the character like they have to look like you or it, you know before we were all into characters because of their personality or what they did. I mean, who who looks like Bugs Bunny or or Donald Duck or Goofy and. Uh, well, maybe well, some I'm, look like Goofy. Yeah, I was <laughs> going to say, I have a couple of coworkers that look like Goofy. <laughs> but the, Boy, these, I mean, were, is... these were even collected in comic books like that. And so, I mean, they're, they're, all these Disney characters had a whole life in print media that no one even realized anymore. And that was going to be the reprint. It was going to have all the comics from the Sundays from 1945, 1949. And it says right on there, that Floyd wrote an introduction for it. And they, yeah. it's the same company does the Uncle Scrooge comics and all that. But now they're pulling stuff from the Uncle Scrooge reprints that have already been printed in some of these reprints. Boy, I wonder how you can get a hold of some of those. Well, it's, at some point, they're going to be, if this woke stuff keeps up, those are going to go up in price because that's the only way you'll be able to read them is the original copies. Man. And that's one reason I like the Internet Archive site is sometimes people will make PDF files of these vintage books and they'll put them up there. And you can't get them any other way. So until you can buy one, I, I'm for that. Let's people see it. Now, this is interesting. The, if you look in the upper left corner, I, I noticed this uh, a couple weeks ago because we were talking about Darby O'Gill. That's the king of the leprechauns with all the characters. Oh, wow. And how many people even noticed that? This was an interview Walt did on the BBC, and I have it on my Rumble channel. And... Uh, he talks about the animated characters. It was filmed in 1959. That was the year Darby O'Gill came out. But he probably was in England because the film had just come out. Because it was, I think it's aired in July. But I just thought it was interesting that there was uh, the King of Leprechauns among all of his characters, showing you yeah. how 
important. And it's when you know Disney history, you notice things like that that yeah that most people won't notice. But we've yeah, talked a lot and, about Darby O'Gill, so <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, it's a good moment here. Uh, take a moment because you just mentioned your Rumble channel and all those links. Uh, to all of your social media sites and all of these websites where you share this information, rediscovering Walt Disney. I have that uh, clip from uh, the opening day of Disneyland with the pair and everything as well. I put, as long as that lasts. Oh, good, because yeah, if, if you'll if you'll missed it, uh, one of the earlier episodes. If you go back and watch it, uh, YouTube made us um, mute only the part where Walt was speaking um, at the opening of Disneyland. In order to um, satisfy the censors, we had to mute that part. But that link to that is in the description, right? Uh, oh, I didn't put episode. it. I, I didn't put it in the description. It's just on the okay. Rumble channel. But it's uh, on your Rumble channel. Yeah. Okay. Which you can get to at Rediscovering Walt Disney. So if you want to see that ceremony, it's fascinating history. It's got Ronald Reagan there. Yeah. yeah. It's got the governor of California yeah. uh, talking about God. Walt Disney prayer. Then they do the um, national anthem. The military is all there, and it, I looked when when they they're doing the flag raising, and I think that's when they're singing the national anthem. Walt's crying, and in some wow. of the books they say that he would cry when the flag would go up and down at uh, Disneyland, and that's how yeah. invested he was in that stuff. Man, that's incredible stuff. Okay, am I in the silly, silly symphonies? symphonies? Now, okay, this is, was going to be in our character show. We didn't have time for it, but the silly symphonies were a companion series that were around when Mickey Mouse started, and it ended up going for seventy-five different animated shorts. That he's holding the Three Little Pigs book there when it was on his show. Um, it can't this. It was the idea of the composer Carl Stalling. This was from Flowers and Trees. That's the first color cartoon ever made in Technicolor. And it was halfway made in black and white, and Walt stopped it, and they remade it in color. Oh, oh sure. that, that had to that had to be a bad day at the office. I'm sure Roy really loved that. Uh, now Walt's <laughs> music director was Carl Stalling, and he went on to do the Looney Tunes music and Merry Melodies. And it was this was his idea to do these uh, silly symphonies cartoons. Oh, whoops! And it was the first anthology cartoon series. And when it was a, a successful series, all the other studios started doing. Uh, like you had the Merry Melodies, Looney Tunes, Jolly Frolics, uh, Swing Symphonies, Happy Harmonies. They were all knockoffs of the Silly <laughs> Symphony name. Yeah. And what he used, the, now this was Bucky Bug. He was in the Silly Symphonies uh, comic strip. And uh, the, he was, he has a whole life outside of America in the comics. And his girlfriend was June Bug. And that's what these draw, these images are. But he was he was one of the major characters. And that's why I included him in the folder here. He uh, was inspired by some of the bug characters in some of the shorts, but he was never actually in an animated short. And uh, he, he <laughs> yeah, those are marionettes. I mean, these characters were all merchandise. That's how I chose which characters we'd show for the Silly Symphonies. They're all characters that were merchandise. People knew who they were. Uh, this was a, a book that collected them. That They're reprinting them now. I don't know if they're edited now, but this version wasn't edited. It was four or five volumes, and it ran the whole run of the Silly Symphony strip. That's Bucky Bug and June Bug. That's just where they took the image from the cover. And that was when they were leaving the strip. And this is the new reprint they're doing. Um, I don't have that yet, so I can't tell you if anything's removed from it. <laughs> they, might just, they might You'll just carry them over. Yeah. Oh, I, 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 I will let you know. That's... At rediscoveringwaltdisney.com. <laughs> yep. And, and on the Rumble channel, I put all of the uh, Mickey Mouse uh, Theater of the Air episodes from the radio that exist that I, ha I have copies of. They're all up there because they're in the public domain. And I've referenced where all the Silly Symphonies characters are in those shows because this is how popular these characters were. Um, the Three Little Pigs, that was the first uh, successful one. It was caricature, character animation. Uh, we mentioned that before. The first time, these characters were just as popular even in the 60s and 70s as Snow White, Dwarves, all the other characters. I don't know if people know who they are anymore. And right. uh, I'm just making. And they, the oh, Oscar. I remember this. I remember now, this. Well, I got to tell you that there's a story <coughs> about this one. In the original version, he dressed up as a Jewish peddler, and oh. Walt went back in those 1940s and he changed it because of the Holocaust. It was he wasn't asked or anything. But the reason it was in there is because Jewish peddlers went door to door selling brushes back then. It was oh, based wow. on real life. It wasn't to make fun of Jewish people. And uh, Roy got an angry letter from a rabbi about it. And uh, Roy uh, had a response. I'll read this. I've got the response here. He says, we had a, 
many Jewish people and business associates and friends and certainly would avoid purposely demeaning the Jews or any race or nationality. It seems to us this character is no more than many oh, well-known been... Jewish comedians portray. That's the, the contrast of what it was changed to. Uh -huh. And But Walt changed it on his own. There was no pressure to change that. He changed it on his own after World War II. And uh, Kay Kamen, we talked about in the first Legends show, he was the, the merchandiser for Disney, and he was Jewish. And uh, when people would accuse him working for an anti-Semite, he would tell them, well, he would say, Walt has more Jews working for him than the book of Leviticus. <laughs> I just thought that was a great quote. That's a um, good line. He, uh, father. <laughs> yeah. And then, then sometimes the father's a football or he's sausages. There were four, uh, three little pig shorts and they weren't as popular as the original. Then they see this father again as sausage. Um, so where, where would these, where would these air before the, you know, they'd the be, advent of TV and where would you go would, to see these? You would go to a theater and they would mm -hmm. play before the the feature length film. There was, when gotcha. you went to the theater, there were, they would show you a newsreel, a cartoon. There'd be a comedy like Lil and Hardy or the, or the Marx brothers. You'd go there for a whole night. It would, you go to see a movie that was 90 minutes, but you'd be there for like four hours watching all this stuff. Cause there was no television or anything. Wow. And <laughs> the, the newsreel was where people saw their news. Cause they could only hear it on the radio. They couldn't That's see it unless they went to the newsreel. Now we just get the same, you know, three ads on rotation yeah. for a half hour before, and then trailers for 10 movies before we finally get Well, the, the, it all got shut down in the 50s. That's the, what the characters were like in the parks. Um, yeah. The, the, so. now the, three, the reason the three little pigs they say caught on is because of that song, Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf? And people tied that in with the Great Depression. Um, mm. And and uh, before I talk about that, I'm going to finish about the three little pigs. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. My bad. That's no, okay. Uh, the Three Little Pigs was also the cartoon that got Chuck Jones interested in the animation. He went on to the Looney Tunes because they were three characters that look alike, but they have different personalities. And that, that's what the real breakthrough was with that. And it's also said that Hitler's favorite song was Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf? I don't, I've seen that in documentaries. And I don't know why wow. that would be. It would have a different connotation with Hitler. Wow. And Walt made three sequels to Three Little Pigs, but none of them were as popular as the original. And that's why he always said he wouldn't do sequels to his films. And he'd always say, you can't top pigs with pigs. And they, he brought him back one more time to do, to sell war bonds. And, uh, that, that's, uh, I guess that's the story of the three little pigs. I've got that's all there. That's the story of the in, three little in, pigs. In the cartoon, in the comic strips, the, the big bad wolf would hang out with Br 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 bear and Br Fox. He would be called Br <laughs> Wolf, by the way. I've seen that. Now that's this wild. This is King Midas, and he was the only he was a character in the only uh film Walt Disney ever directed. It was the Golden Touch. And Walt never directed a film again after that. I he didn't like the experience. He only was a producer after that. Huh. This is the Flying Mouse, and that was another good one. It uh probably is banned now because now it could be read as trans anti-trans, because he wants to be a, he wants to fly like a bird. And the fairy grants his wish, but he has bat wings. And the bats won't accept him because he's not a bat. And there's a <laughs> catchy, catchy song. These are the three blind mice. They're probably banned now, too. We can have three blind mice. Yeah. <laughs> but Walt would always take these nursery rhymes or fairy tales, and he would make them into a silly stuff. He's that, that's from the flying mouse there, where he's got the wings. That that was a prototype for the blue fairy. He would uh, These films would be used as a... a prototype to practice things that he wanted to do in the features so a lot of these were they used technologies that he was going to use in snow white and they invented an oscar category to award walt every year that they he made these he got an oscar that year for the best animated short that's elmer the elephant and he was only in one short but he was a heavily merchandised character and they were going to do a sequel but they never ended up doing that but he had a career in the comics as well and he was de designed and drawn by Walt Kelly, who did a cartoon comic strip called Pogo in the 50s. All the, all the liberals love it because they're always like, it's this great progressive leftist strip. But Walt Kelly had morality and views like Walt. He wouldn't be like this radical left today. It's not that kind of leftism. Mm -hmm. But that's a great little short there. I think we, I even have the link in the previous show where we did all the... Um, animated characters because that's what this folder was for but 
these characters just as popular as the characters we know today. But and when I was a kid, they would show these on the Disney Channel. So I know all of these characters from there. The animals all made fun of him because he was an elephant with a long nose and the big ears. What ends up happening in the story is the tiger's house burns down and he's able to help put it out because he can squirt the water with his trunk. <laughs> and and he has there. And that's one of the merchandise pieces there. Tilly the tiger and Elmer the elephant. And this is from the, there was in the a Good Housekeeping magazine, they would print little write-up stories of these. And that's what that is. This is the grasshopper and the ants. And if you remember, Goofy has that theme song, The World Owes Me a Living. That's where it comes from. It was the same voice, Pino Kovig. And it was about the uh, he, the story, the grasshopper, the ants. He, he fools around all uh, summertime. And then when it's time to uh, winter to come, he has no food to eat. And he has to uh, have the aid of the ants. And I have a version of that in Folked Up America, but we'll, we'll talk about that when it's printed. <laughs> that's an Aesop story, by the way. That's where uh, Aesop fable, that's where this, this grasshopper and the ants come from. Or came from. And that, I guess it's on uh, Disney Plus, but I'm not positive. I don't have Disney Plus. But it, it's yeah, very how many different characters, how many hundreds thousands. of characters, thousands of characters, yeah, has the it, Walt Disney Company produced over the years? And we don't even know these ones anymore. But these right. ones were very, they were very, I mean, everyone knew who these characters were back then because they would be on radio shows and things. And in that Mickey Mouse show, they would come in and people would know who they were. And it's, it's suggested that this strip inspired a bug's life. That, and it's on the DVD version of A Bug's Life, the original DVD version. I can uh, see it. It's an Easter egg, I think. But it, it <clears throat> that's this, it's the same root story, the grasshopper and the ants, but they twist it around with the grasshoppers or the villains. This is the country mouse and the city mouse, and that's also an Aesop fable. Now, they had names. The country mouse is Abner Mouse. And the city mouse was named Monty. And people would know that back then, but not today. Right. And they appeared in media and comic strips and, and merchandising. There's no dialogue in that sh in this short, by the way. It's just all acting and pantomime, and that was probably so they could get into to uh, practice do like Dopey in Snow White because he doesn't speak. It's all pantomime. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, and I remember this because the mouse gets drunk and all this. I mean, they, I was a kid watching this stuff, and I didn't become a raging alcoholic, but now they all put disclaimers on everything. <laughs> this is from one called Music Land, and it, the reason they made this one is because in the 1930s, there was a real concerned uh, conflict going on between jazz music and classical music. And the story is a Romeo and Juliet story where the uh, son of the jazz king he falls in love with the daughter of the classical music queen and they end up getting together and it's the sea of harmony. So that, that's what this one, this short's about. In land of symphony, land of jazz. And then in the ends of what happens is they build a bridge, the bridge of harmony between the two. I mean, these are very clever shorts and, and yeah. it's just sad. No one sees these anymore. But Roy Jr. put them all out on DVD about 20 years ago, so you can also track them down that way. They were there were two different uh, DVD sets, and I think that the the Jazz King's based on Oliver Hardy because it sure looks like a caricature of him. Oh yeah, they have a double wedding. That's uh, Max Hare and Toby the Tortoise. They were in two shorts. The first one was the Tortoise and the Hare, and it's acknowledged that Max Hare inspired Bugs Bunny. Yeah, I remember this. Uh, I'm just trying to think. It feels like on TBS growing up, it feels like they, they would have like a half an hour where they just play they would these show, shorts. That, but not that, the Disney's. That was wouldn't have been on TBS because okay. Ted Turner owned TBS. Ted, maybe, well, uh, Ted Turner know. bought the Warner Brothers archive because he wanted to own his favorite movie, Gone with the Wind. And he protected mm -hmm. Gone with the Wind. It's too bad something like that didn't happen with Song of the South. Because Gone with the Wind is more, I don't want to say it's offensive, but it's got things in it that people would object yeah. to more so than Song of the South. 
it, but both films are important. That's what Bugs Bunny looked like at the beginning. Though both those films are important in history in a lot of different areas of history. They shouldn't mm -hmm. be censored like they are. Nope. Is that, now I guess uh, Gone to the Wind has a disclaimer on the front. That's Bugs Bunny, but you can see how that inspired it. Uh, you had me thinking now. I'm just wondering, and maybe you know off the top of your head, if you wanted to right now, because we've talked about how impossible it is to find um, uh, Song of the South. Can you find not to not to go off tangent here, but can you if you wanted to watch Gone with the Wind, where would you go for that? Well, I, I think it's on one of the streaming channels where they put a disclaimer or something on the front, but I have it on DVD and Blu-ray, so I always have a hard copy. I'm one of those gonna... days, one of those days it was in a five dollar bin on Blu-ray. That's when I got a Blu-ray copy. I had a DVD one from years before. All right, so it's available on Voodoo Max Watch uh, TCM and prime video uh if you want to watch gone with the wind See, and, and that that film it, it has some of the black characters make you want to cringe but song of the south isn't like that <laughs> well, well what do you think i think her, what was the the one maid she always says she's not birthing no babies or something right. like that just the way yeah. she screeches uh -huh. that <laughs> there's no characters like that in song of the south mm -hmm. now this this character was a little hiawatha we talked about him before but he also had a huge comic book career comic strip as well and also overseas, he's still a popular character in Europe. I don't know if they've erased him now because of wokeness, but these are some of the examples of the vintage comic strips he was in. I love that gag there. He makes the swing out of the t the totem poles. It's a good idea. But now, but now that would probably be considered. <laughs> oh, offensive. that's totally offensive. Yeah, it's a religious symbol. Yeah, uh huh. I mean, you can see that. But we, we went over in one of their previous shows how now this is mm -hmm. you can make a teepee for the dog. We went over how Walt was going to do an American Indian film, and he was very respectful to all of that. You got to see this, uh, though. TP for the dog. Yeah. And that would have been on the back of the comic, and you'd cut it out and make that. <laughs> okay. Who's, well, talk to me about Ferdinand the Bull. Now, this character, he's not remembered anymore. I know they did a CGI version a few years ago, another company, but this was the original adaptation. Walt Disney did this. The the book was uh, Gandhi's favorite book, supposedly. Okay. And the book's about a gentle bull who would rather sit quietly and smell the flowers instead of uh, fight the matador. Gandhi endorsed Ferdinand yeah. the Bull. And supposedly Hitler burned this book. I don't know if that's true because people put stuff on the internet all the time like that, that but yeah. you don't know if it's you don't know accurate. For sure, yeah. The matador is supposed to be a, a caricature of Walt Disney. There's more of him coming up later, so you can okay. see it. <laughs> but uh, it was because this came out in 1938. It's a pacifist story. People associated it with being anti World War II. But uh -huh. I don't know if that's true. Th these are some examples of where the story was printed uh, from the Silly Symphony in, in uh, books and ma magazines. And to this day, it's supposed to play on Christmas Eve in many of the European country countries. The, the, all the people there are caricatures of the animators. That's why I put them all in there. That is wild. <laughs> that's smart. I can't remember all the titles of what it. That's Ward Kimball. He <laughs> always seemed to be the most in those movies as a caricature. And that's Walt as the Matador. <laughs> that's good stuff. And, yeah. And I, I remember this the cartoon. He rips the, his hair off and everything. Now Walt would put before Snow White came out. He put all these together in a package feature with all. They were all Oscar winners, and that predated Snow White. But if it wasn't for these silly symphonies, there wouldn't be Snow White the way we know it because he would do things like camera technique, animating humans, animating dwarf characters. That all came out of the silly symphonies. And Ferdinand was the last one. And it's debated if it counts as a silly symphony because there's no song in it. But I included it there just to... So you, you got an, an idea of another character. When uh, Walt got an Oscar for Snow White, they even talked about Ferdinand when they're listing off all the characters Walt created. Shirley Temple gives him an Oscar. We'll see a little later. And she talks about Ferdinand. Now, this is the magic mirror. And you wouldn't know, think of this, but he also had a career outside of Snow White. And Walt usually used him as an MC on his radio show or his television shows. This is from his first Christmas special, 1950, at One Hour in Wonderland. And here's what the magic mirror looked like. I think he's the next. Uh, yeah. Wow. And he was voiced by Hans Conrad, who Conrad, who did Captain Hook. And uh -huh. Walt, he, he continued to reappear as the magic mirror even after Walt died in the 1970s. And the mythology they invented about the magic mirror 
is it was kept in the prop room at Disney. And uh, he would conjure up clips from the Walt's uh, animated films. And that's how they would use him for a device like that. He would host the show. And then Disney lore, he this is the magic mirror wrote fan mail because he wanted to host the show again. And I, he come out of the mirror and that's what he looks like out of the mirror. He's in disguise. <laughs> And all the fan letters were written, mag, signed Magic Mirror, but it was written backwards. Oh, wow. Okay. So Walt went down to the basement and got the Magic Mirror. And <laughs> the Magic Mirror also revealed in, in one of these shows, he has a nephew named Willoughby. So I don't know how that worked, but uh, you wouldn't think of the Magic Mirror being a major character in Walt Disney lore, but he was. Because he, he probably hosted five or six shows. That's the last time in the 70s. He did two shows about just the villains, and that predates when they made the Disney villains into a marketing thing. The, ne the next character, he also was the MC for Disney, and it's Jiminy Cricket. And what happened with him is he came back in the 1950s when they did the Mickey Mouse Club, and they did 26 educational shorts with Jiminy Cricket. And my favorite one is the one called I'm No Fool. And I think we linked to all these in the, the show with the animated characters. But Jiminy Cricket would come out and he would he would uh, draw out a chalkboard, a fool, and the person that was supposed to represent you. And he would sing this song about being a fool. And he would show how like a, the fool would play in electricity and water and he would get electrocuted and die. But the smart kid wouldn't do that. And, th th this yeah. is, and they would just be draw. You, you probably wouldn't see them now because he would call the fool stupid and yeah. an idiot and all this stuff. I, I just <laughs> love that when I was there. And it's the original voice, Jiminy Cricket, Cliff Edwards. He, yeah. he came back. And this was one on water safety. He did a series of shorts on the encyclopedia. He did a series of shorts on your... That's the fool there. He's pulled off the chalkboard. Uh, <laughs> he did record albums. He did nature films. He did a series on your human biology. And he, he, Jiminy Cricket had this whole career doing all these educational shorts and records and things. And on Walt's TV show, he'd be the master of ceremonies. This was a record where he was with Walt in Disneyland. This record here I had when I was a kid. I inherited it from my grandparents. And there's a song in there for subtraction about 10 cannibals and they eat, they keep eating each other. Oh, no. And the, oh. the last cannibal eats himself up. Okay. And my grandma always said that always freaked my uncle out. I bet, <laughs> man. You're kidding. That is not good. Oh. And this is Tinker Bell, and she was also she was Disney's hostess on these TV shows and a lot of the children's records and everything. She would be the one that would make the chimes, she'd turn the page. People don't remember the record albums now. Yes. You read along in the book. Yes. Yes. But, Tinker Bell was a very major character in a character and character in Walt's stable of stars. And we saw her every week on Walt's TV show and where she'd come out mm -hmm. and do the theme song. And Jimmy McDonald, we talked about in one of the, the other shows, he was the one that came up with the chime sound for Tinker Bell. So it had a personality because you, if you remember her chime sound, it would almost be like speaking. And in, in the uh, intro to Walt's show, that's the only time she ever had a wand. She never has a wand in Peter Pan. That's why I had that there to point that piece Absolutely. of trivia out. Yeah. She they also did Peter Pan peanut butter commercials with <laughs> uh, Tinkerbell back in the 50s. So cool. Now, but the peanut butter isn't named after the Disney Peter Pan. That dates back to the 1930s. Oh, wow. They added her later then. Yeah, well, uh, they added they've licensed months. the Disney characters before. They did it recently in like 2008. And uh now when one thing that Walt, this leads into this next thing. One thing Walt doesn't get credit for is he invented the Christmas special, the animated mm. Christmas special. <clears throat> and that's what this next folder is about. And it was it, it, going back to the 1930s, Walt would do Christmas radio shows. I have some of them on the ramp, the rumble channel already. All the right. First TV, the first TV show he did was called one hour in Wonderland and it promoted uh, Alice in Wonderland. And it the, the framing device was the he would that he had the actress there that played Alice. She did the the voice and the live action reference. And she, that's her next to Walt there, and that's what the live action reference looked like. But he would have the characters dressed up on the show. And this is from the second one he did for Peter Pan, and the framing device was the magic mirror came out. He would show clips from the films, and this was based on Walt's studio Christmas party. They would do this. They would have clips of Walt's films and the, the animators and staff would come with their kids and they would watch the films. And the uncle Remus was always there. 
this was the first Christmas special that considered a Christmas special. It was done with marionettes. And this was after Walt did that first show. And it's on DVD, The Spirit of Christmas, but you can also find it online on YouTube. There were also the, the these were the three little dwarfs. It was a short cartoon that aired in Chicago for years, and it's based on a famous popular song of the time. And that's what it looked like. They were stop motion puppets. They didn't speak or anything. They just kind of moved around to the music. It's only a little short. Walt did all these toys for tots things. And that's what these next pictures are. But uh, after Walt did those two uh, Christmas specials. He decided to do this one called From All of Us to All of You. And it's still a perennial in some European countries to this day. Wow. And this, we're going to go through what it was. The This is the original version. We have it linked to in the comment and our things there, our links. Someone restored it, what it would look like when it first aired. A fan restored this. And Tinkerbell came out and introduced Walt. And he was introduced cricket-sized because Mickey Mouse and Tinkerbell and Jiminy Cricket are going to put on a Christmas show. <laughs> and Jiminy Cricket would come out and he would sing this song from all of us to all of you. Mickey was playing the piano during this. And, you know, Pluto would come out. Had all the A lot of the characters were in this. And what would have, and Chip and Dale came in for one sequence. They did a, they played a cartoon where uh, they were in, uh, I think it was either the one with Mickey's Christmas tree or they were fighting Donald around the, his Christmas tree. Because they were in the tree in the short. <laughs> uh, what would happen for the rest of the show if they would take uh, Christmas cards from the characters in the animated features and they would show clips from those films and in this time period there was no home video, no DVD, no YouTube, this is the only time you could see these clips year every year wow, and, yeah. Yeah. And, and so this was an annual visit of these characters because you wouldn't see them otherwise for seven years because they would rotate the film seven years man and so this was the, but this was a great framing device that it was the Christmas cards of all the Disney characters. And then you would see your favorite films. This was for when, the, when it was new lady, of the tramp was the new film. And then uh, that ended up getting cut out eventually because they would start rotating in the latest film at the end of the show. And that was when the, the dwarf sing a song, when they would do the, when it came back in the future years, Tinkerbell came out and opened a, a special present, and it was a surprise. And, like, this was the one for the Aristocats. And in the oh. intro for that, it was called the Aristocrats, and they changed it to Cats. There's for the Jungle Book. They did it for Sword in the Stone as well, but I didn't have an image of that. And this was with Robin Hood. The last time they did that was with uh, Mickey's Christmas Carol. And then at the end of the show, Jiminy Cricket came out, and he sang When You Wish Upon a Star, and all the <laughs> characters came out like it was a hymn and I have the shots of all the characters listening to Jimmy cricket, uh, sing the song. Some of it I think was reused animation, but the point was that all the characters came together and see their song of the South right there with all the other characters where they were major characters. They were in both of Walt's live action Christmas shows in 1950, 1951. He had uncle Remus and all the characters there. He played the animated sequence for a different one each year for the Christmas show. And uh, the the uh, uh, before we get to the next pictures. Oh, what? Well, no, you you can stop at that one. I just want to finish up okay. on this. When we were kids, they would play Mickey's Christmas Carol on television, and they would always have a little making of of the latest Disney movie at the end. But that all started all the way back to Walt's first Christmas or first television project, One Hour in Wonderland. Come right through with from all of us to all of you, and then in our time, they would just do that with Mickey's Christmas Carol. And uh, the uh, other thing that I wanted to mention with the Christmas films is uh, Mr. Magoo's Christmas Carol ties in with this because that was the first Christmas special. And when it first aired, this was the greeting at the end of the show. And this is from the, what the fan put back together. It's never been released on DVD or anything. So it's the only way you can see it as it was. But uh, that was the first Christmas special. Other studios started thinking, well, why don't we do an original Christmas special? Mr. Magoo's Christmas Carol came along a few years later, 1962. And when it first aired, right after the show ended, Walt called the producer on the telephone. And he said to him, "It this is the best show I've seen in years. It's wonderful. I wanted to personally congratulate you. Not only is, it, is this generation going to watch this, but your children's children's children will watch this show. That's how good it is. I just couldn't wait to tell you. <laughs> and I, that's the only record I've ever seen of Walt. Call, wow. and it was, 
they put it in theaters after that because of how popular they thought it would be. And it was with an episode of Mr. Magoo's storybook with Snow White. Um, that's the only example I have of Walt calling a competitor, telling him how great the project was. That's and cool. you, UPA Studios was founded by a lot of the communist strikers, but they'd all left by then when Mr. Magoo's Christmas Carol was made. And after Mr. Magoo's Christmas Carol, 1964 was Rudolph, 65 was Charlie Brown, 66 was The Grinch. So you wonder if Walt had lived, if he would have got into doing Christmas specials on television, because Chuck Jones did The Grinch. And that was the year he died. And he just doesn't get credit. That we wouldn't have all these Christmas characters if it wasn't for Walt Disney. Right, right. Uh, let's see. Am I, I going we'll, to the hosts we'll, now? No, we just did the hosts. I'm uh, sorry. I'm, Winnie, I'm Winnie sorry. The Poo, I, I Poo Poo Winnie the Pooh's yep. next. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, fire away, sir. Winnie the Pooh was the last of these characters that got developed under Walt, and he had a, a life in comic strips all the way till 1977. But what this is about is they ran Winnie the Pooh wow. for president. He, they ran him for look, president four times. Look at that. That is awesome. And what they did was they... they this, this right. I love yeah. it. I, I could post that out if people want to read that on Twitter or anything. Yeah, you got Martin Van Buren, Andrew yep. Jackson... <laughs> Winnie the Pooh ran for president in 1968, 1972, 1976, and 1980. And they would have uh, Winnie the Pooh was more popular than Mickey Mouse. And I, around 2000, the uh, Winnie the Pooh merchandise was it sold two billion dollars a year, something like that. Maybe it was more than that. It was most popular character merchandising ever was Winnie the Pooh in the year 2000 because he appeals to everybody. And uh, he was only in under Walt. They did three shorts, and then they cut them together into a feature. They were featurettes, and that was in 1977. The voice of Winnie the Pooh was Sterling Holloway, and he was a Republican, conservative Republican. So we know which party Winnie the Pooh probably ran for. And in our <laughs> links on that uh, show with the characters, there was I have his campaign song. There was a campaign song for Winnie the Pooh. Okay. And what they, they did was Sears would... Uh, have people go in to, to vote for Winnie the Pooh. And the Sears, if you remember back then, Winnie the Pooh's characters, they were associated with Sears, department store. Right. And you would go there to vote. And if you, uh, they would se select 50 different families, one for each state to win a free trip to Disneyland. Oh, wow. That's cool. And they had a train with all the characters in it. And they would go and visit all these uh, different cities around the country. And there's stories where people were waiting at like three in the morning for Winnie the Pooh to come show up in their hometown. Do we... Do we know what was on his uh, platform for president? It's in the song, and it's Is kind it of funny. Real? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Honey and, for everyone. And apparently, uh, the Hundred Acre Wood is in America, and Winnie the Pooh must be thirty-six years old. So. <laughs> 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 That's Sterling Holloway when he was in Dumbo. He was also the Stork in Dumbo. He was Ka in uh, the Jungle Book. That's fun stuff. But that's just one of those little footnotes in history. Now, if you ran a character for president, they'd have all this woke uh, ideology behind them. But back then, it was just a fun little thing that they did. They ran Winnie the Pooh for president. All right. Toontown? Yep. Now, this draws back to where I talked in the Disneyland show, how people wanted uh, to know where the characters lived. And Walt was going to create Mickey Mouse theme park. Well, they added Mickey Mouse's birthday land in 1988 at Disneyland. And that became Mickey's Toontown. And it's still there. And so that came full circle yeah. and all, all this is, is the uh, logo was on a lot of the things they made in 1988, the end of the show. That is Mickey's such birthday. a late. It was 80s. animated. <laughs> it was animated. If you remember it, I remember the little oh. tune that went with it. Oh, wow. No, that's when Disney cared about their heritage. This is when it's announcing it was birthday land, but it was in the happy meal toys. They even had cool Happy Meal toys when we were kids. That's birthday. Yeah, now land. I'm missing. Yeah, thanks a lot, Ed. Now I'm missing not only uh, what Disney used to be, but now I'm missing Happy Meals too. Well, we, we could do a show <laughs> on McDonald's history. <laughs> no, I think everyone's going to need to go to rediscoveringwaltdisney.com. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you you wouldn't, uh, Colonel Sanders, what they've erased on his history. Yeah. Yeah. Now th this was tied in with the birthday. There was a cow that had Mickey's uh, image on the cow. And Disney bought it, and it was it lived at Disneyland. That balloon in the previous shot, that was a thing where it flew around the country, Mickey's head. And this was what it became, what his birthday land became Toontown. That's with all the characters recently, because now Claire Bell Cow is there. And the last bit here is about the castle. I never got to mention this. I, th I think it was in that, is it in that folder? There was No, Disney that was the last, castle? that was the last picture in that folder, sir. 
Mm. Is it in the Figment one? No, it's not in Figment. Oh. I thought it was in the Toontown one. Well, let me get back here. Oh, I'm sorry. There's another folder. Man, you hide these folders inside folders, and it's my fault for not seeing no, them. So I'm sorry. I apologize. I no, thought, it's me. I, I didn't it's realize me. that I had it in a folder. I thought I just had it keep Bro, going. Bro, it doesn't matter if I put these glasses on or not. I'm <laughs> not going to see it, now, apparently. I wanted to mention this about the castle, because I didn't mention this before. Okay. Well, when, and when Walt was making those films in England, after The Sword and the Rose, he, was, he wanted to do a King Arthur movie. Okay. And the Di Disneyland Castle was originally King Arthur's castle. And there was confusion whose castle this was when Disneyland opened. Because some of the uh, PR said it was Snow White's castle. Some said it was Cinderella. Right. There's some controversy there. And the reason Walt wanted to build Disneyland in a year and a day is because that's how long King Arthur's Search for the Holy Grail went for. <laughs> now, this film came out the year Walt would have made his King Arthur movie, so it's probably fortunate he didn't make it. He didn't make it because Sword in the Rose didn't do a, a lot of money. So he, he canceled it. He ended up making uh, the, uh, the Sword in the Stone. That's based on King Arthur. But this was what Sin Snow White's castle looked like. I put all the castles here. So you can see that castle does not resemble any of the castles. That's Prince Charming's castle in Snow White. Goodness gracious. That, I mean, that, that what, what do you think that's going for on Zillow? I don't know. <laughs> that's Cinderella's castle. And they oh. built that at Disney World. Okay, yeah. It's more vertical. And this is what uh, the Sleeping Beauty's castle looks like. It looks nothing like the one at Disneyland. And what this is here, this is Shirley Temple. She was made the queen of Disneyland in 1957, and they rededicated the Disneyland castle. And if you, <laughs> you don't remember, Shirley Temple was a child star, but when she grew up, she became a Republican uh, politician. Oh, wow, really? And one of the things, she was an ambassador when we were kids. She was now, I, I knew that. Yeah. I knew that, but I she, didn't think of her as a party. She fought child trafficking in Hollywood. Yeah. And if you remember, she was a child star, and she had stories about... Uh, some of the executives exposing themselves to her and things like that. Even back then, yeah. man. I can't remember what it was called, but early 1930s, there was some short where they had these little kids. Uh, it wasn't Little Rascals, but it was something like that. And it was all sexual innuendo. I've seen it somewhere, but it was made all the way back then. So, th so there's always been something like this going on. I don't know how deep it is, but it's it, just interesting. She, when she became an adult, she grew up to fight this because she was a child star herself. So she was aware of what happened there. And this was when Walt got his uh, Oscar for Snow White and Seven Dwarfs. It was a, a regular Oscar with seven little Oscars and Shirley Temple presented it to him. And look, look, it's, it's on the radio. Yeah. With the microphone there. <laughs> they, they filmed it. I've seen footage of it, but you would oh. just see it in the theater. Right. Okay. The Oscars back then weren't like what they are now. It was just, no. a, it was like a ceremony for uh like you go to a business awards thing today it wasn't like <laughs> yeah. this big event it became that with television and bob hope was the one who hosted it more than anyone else i think it was 19 uh -huh. times something like that that's so but cool. that's the only time they, they did an oscar with seven little oscars okay and now now it's figment because i consider them to be part of the disney cast of characters even though they started in the theme parks uh -huh. But they were all also Figment was in an, a few animated shorts. We linked to those in the character show a few weeks ago. <clears throat> we, mentioned, gonna... we mentioned Figment was created and Dreamfinder were created for a, a land they didn't build in Disneyland. It was Discovery Bay. And what inspired it was Magnum P.I. Because there was a line where uh, it was about uh, a goat being a figment of his imagination. And figments don't eat tropical flowers. And they got an idea. We'll have a dragon named Figment. And when they That's build Epcot, cool. when they build Epcot, they made them into characters and they put them in the ride. And uh, that's what the animatronic looked like. Uh, the voices of the characters. Chuck McCann was a dream finder. He was in a lot of DuckTales cartoons. He, and this, uh, this here was the voice of uh, Figment, Billy Bartley. He was a midget actor. And that's what he described himself as. So don't give me letters. <laughs> but he was in a lot of old movies. I, Little House in the Prairie. I remember all these. He was probably the first uh, famous dwarf actor. Oh, wow. And okay. he had that great voice. That's Chuck McCann. He was. He came out of having a kiddie show on television. But he has had a great voice for animation. And mm -hmm. I always remember from DuckTales. He was the Beagle Boys. 
Uh, he was a lot of minor characters. This man walking around was Ron Schneider. I have a story about, I met him when I was a kid and he remembered me because he told the story. It was on YouTube. I don't have it saved because I thought he was Jesus. And when I left, I cried by Jesus. And he remembered that his whole career because we went there in 84. <laughs> by Jesus. <laughs> That's awesome, man. But I was that kid because I remember that when it happened. And <laughs> that is funny, dude. And they were going to have a show about Dreamfinder on the Disney Channel when it started, but that got canceled. Now, leave that up because I have a line, for, a verse from the song that's not in the song. Okay. And you remember the song, uh, uh, One Little Spark, and this is what, I'm not going to sing it. I'm just going to recite it. <laughs> yeah, okay. One bright idea, one right connection can give your life a new direction. So many times we're whistling in the dark, then uh, D-Do, there's a spark. <laughs> <laughs> that was just cut out of the song, but okay. Anyway, on that character show, I linked to the whole ride. You can see what it looked like. The ride was ripped out in the nineties because the executives claimed, that, or they went to experts. They claimed it wasn't educational enough. And this is this happened to me around the nineties with the PC culture because they did this with Sesame Street too with the vintage shows. Because when we were kids, it was a filthy ghetto. Yeah, but, we, but it had a lot of personality back then, <laughs> and. uh they tore Figment out and they realized they made a mistake because he'd become the mascot for Epcot like the Orange Bird was for When did uh, they Walt bring Disney. that ride back? They didn't uh, bring back Figment. Okay. They just put him back in the in the early 2000s. They just stuck him in a movie with uh, uh, okay. what, what's the, Eric Idle. He was from Monty Python and they sang about the senses of uh, the five senses. Okay. And uh, Dreamfinder is nowhere to be seen. They put him in uh, they did a Figment talk uh, Comic uh, comic book a few years ago, but it was all kind of woke and PC. Now that I we talk, want a, a okay. shirt with that right there on it. That's now a we, cool we shirt, and man. we talked about the Orange Bird, how he got yeah. banned for a while because they considered him to be homophobic because the singer of the song Anita Bryant was against gay marriage, and she advocated in, in politics against that. And it always gets brought up online by who, whenever they. What's the what's the orange bird have to do with that? She's because she sang the song, so that and that this was probably the first example I could think of where some something got canceled because of uh, <sighs> wokeness before there was wokeness. But the other and see, he's got the little uh, birthmark like Mickey Mouse yeah, no, there on his no. head. That's why I had yeah. that there. Oh, but how he? Let's be honest, it's a tattoo. Yeah, <laughs> how he came back was the Japanese loved this character, sure. and they. And they started merchandising him, and now he's back at Disney World. But that's what's going on with Splash Mountain. The Japanese refused to remove it from Tokyo Disney. So maybe that'll bring it back someday. That's so, interesting. I, that's so, why I put that in there, because they saved the Orange Bird. Maybe they'll end up saving uh, the Uncle Remus, Splash Mountain, and all that. Wow. So we've got, in other words, American history is being saved by Japan. Okay, it makes and, total and you, sense. And you know, anime, they, the people that started anime, they they said that the reason they started it was because of the Mickey Mouse comics and the Uncle Scrooge comics and things that came over after World War II. And they a lot of that early anime stuff, they took the poses right from those comic strip panels. And that never gets credited to Disney. I don't really care for anime, but uh, <laughs> yeah. that's where it started from. Uh, so I where think, to next? I think sir? Epcot's next. Epcot? So, okay. Now, this is the real story of Epcot, because we never got to this. Okay. And Epcot stands for, it's an acronym, stands for Experimental Prototype Community of Tomorrow. I've In our links, we have the fi film Walt made. It was the last film he made before he died. It's debated between two films. This was a set. He made this film to present the idea of what he was going to do there to the Florida legislature. And they'd already established Reedy Creek and everything by then. And I just took stills from, from the uh, film here. Uh, in the 19th, now where all this come from was, uh, you want to pa pause there a second, because I'll set up what Epcot was. Okay. This all come from in the 1960s. You had a lot of the experts going on about man-made climate change and we're mm -hmm. destroying the earth and how we need to depopulate and all these things. It was all anti-humanity. And Walt grew up in the progressive era, so he'd heard all this stuff back when they were doing eugenics. And he wanted to make a, a society where people weren't just a cog in the wheel, because that's where the experts were going. You, were, you weren't celebrating individuality anymore. It was about being a cog in the wheel. So he wanted to uh, make a, a, this community 
there'd be a nice place to live where you'd have all of the technologies of the future there. And that, that was original concept of Epcot. They had a model in the uh, Mer the world's New York World's Fair with the uh, Carousel Progress, and they called it Progress City. In our links, we have a link to someone create recreated what that show looked like. And you see the model all animated what the city would have been. And that was the first glimpse anyone ever got of Epcot. And if you now we can keep going, and I'll. Uh, okay. In this film, he says that uh, part of the inspiration was how industries were always showing him new things that they were inventing, and he wanted to use them, but they would say there wasn't a market for it. So he wanted to create a market for all these technologies. So he wanted to have like a world showcase where you would go in and you could see what all these technologies would be, and you could rotate the technologies in and out as new technologies are made. And you can see how this land was. He, he represents, uh, I think, six miles on that map standing there. And that was where the theme park was, just a tiny part of the whole project. And this is the model of Progress City. And what would have been in the center is a hotel. Mm. And th this just tells you where all the different things are. They had apartment buildings. Some of it was underground so they could control the weather. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, it's in the video. Oh, it's a, a film. What in the they world? Want... Is that going to be in the description? Yeah, it's in the description. Okay, cool. And I'll I have the, I have the video on the Rumble channel as well, so it's on both places. I put it there for historical purposes. Don't forget, if, if you want more great information from Ed, uh, once we conclude this 12-part series today, uh, rediscoveringwaltdisney.com, it is up there on the screen right now. Gosh, man. Can you imagine? Uh, it this... What he did was he looked at a lot of Jules Verne's books and like movies like Metropolis, and he was going to wow, actually build this. Yeah. And one of his close friends was Ray Bradbury, and he would come in and uh, they would talk about what this was going to be, Epcot. And Bradbury was impressed that all these writers were talking about all this stuff, and Walt was actually trying to build it. And when, when Walt showed him the animatronics with Lincoln, he told uh, Walt, we, we should build a... a schools where you go in and you talk to the different historical people you could program the computer with all of their writings so you know what their answers would be with modern uh, concepts and everything modern events that's the beginning of ai and now this is the traffic would have been underneath the city and there wow. was the lower level was just going to be trucks bringing all the supplies the, oh. the middle level were cars there were vents and everything in this film they show how the, uh, the smog would have gone out so you wouldn't have suffocated down there and this was so you people wouldn't get run over by cars. Everyone in the in Epcot owned their own car, but the road, your garage was on the out, out uh, outskirts of the city, and you would just go out there to leave uh, the city. Inside the city, everything was electrical uh, vehicles, the monorail, the people mover, and everything. But it was all run from a nuclear power plant, and that's why he wanted the rights to build what he wanted because nuclear energy was the cleanest energy there there is. It's I mean it still is. Incredible but now everybody man. panics about it. I know. And this is what it looked like underground there. Th this here. How, is, how did you say they got the uh, the smog and all the pollution and stuff out of there from the cars? There's some vents there. It's in one of these okay. pictures. It'll show there were there's going to be vent or there were going to be vents. And uh, he had a, a shopping center where people come from all over the world, and you could buy all the different things from the world. That eventually became World Showcase. It uh, mm -hmm. the Epcot they built. Uh, this is where they would have in the video they talk or film they talk about there were going to be churches and parks and everything just outside the convention center. This is where the, one of the spokes where people lived with the houses. Mm. You can see the cars and the roads and everything. The the in the middle there, that's the electric uh, transport. Uh, this would have been for the industrial park because there would have been a monorail that took you to industri an industrial park where everybody worked that lived there, or they would work at the theme park, and. So Oh, go ahead. I, I, I realize when Walt died, so did Epcot. Uh, yeah. Effectively. I mean, what was the after his death? What was the fight like as far as continuing this and turning it into what it is today? Well, with the different what ended parts? up happening, Rory focused on Disney World because they knew how to build a theme park. Mm -hmm. And the Epcot Center got moved away. It wasn't Epcot Center, it was just called Epcot. Uh, it became Epcot Center because when they came to Roy with all the plans for the city, they show it was Mark Davis and a few other guys. 
they wanted to build Epcot as the city Walt wanted. They did it p- pitched to Roy, and Roy said, Walt's gone. We're not going to build this. Ugh. So then they decided they would do a, a theme park, an educational theme park, and there was going to be the World Showcase and Future World. They combined them together, and that became Epcot Center, and that's what they ended up building. It, was, it, was supposed, it ended up being like a World's Fair. Cop out. Yeah. Well, this was very ambitious. Walt always said that he would, oh, uh, yeah. if he oh. lived 15 years, he had 15 more years. He said this the summer before he died, he told his son in law he just needed 15 more years and he would build this and it would surpass everything he'd built up to that time, everything he'd done. And in the end, the, the, just stay paused there. The original concept was he was hoping other Epcots would be built around the world and they would all mm-hmm. interconnect. And it would just be a whole new way of, of living. Like you know, it, it it would have been all about individuality. All the all the things he celebrated in his films. It would have been all about that instead of today, like where they they don't want people to have kids. They don't want you to eat meat. They don't want you to drive a car. All these different things. And Goodness. that's where they showed the film. There was that that was after he died. That was showed to the legislature. That's where they were building a model of Epcot. And it was all animated. All and that's Ray Bradbury. And they they had uh, I've got a stat there where they animated it. It had uh, the just the thing where they built the animation part of it. It was it had five, three almost three thousand vehicles that actually moved on that model because it was all electric, so people would get an idea what the city was going to be. Well, and look at that. That is wild stuff, well, man. When Walt died, Ray Bradbury, the yeah. writer, came in because he knew Walt and he worked on the show that's inside the, the biosphere earth, that dome. I don't know if mm-hmm. it's still a show in there, but Ray Bradbury uh, created that. Uh, let me just finish through my notes here on everything. Ahead, Epcot. Um, but that, this is why the Reedy Creek district was created. And the reason right. they built, they built it in a swamp is because it would keep uh, like thieves and things out. Cause they used the swamp as a fence. It was going to be built right up to the edge of the swamp. And Walt says this in the vi- in the film. He says that's why it's built by the swamp. And uh, another video we link to in the in the description. It will be in October 1966 uh, or or it was 65. He uh, did a, a presentation with uh, the governor of Florida where they talk about what they're going to build. He doesn't talk about Epcot there because it wasn't revealed yet. He was going to build a city. He got all this because he wanted to build the theme park. That's what the press wanted to hear. And it only got uh, out because the media wanted to know who's buying up all this land in Florida because Walt was buying it under dummy names and dummy companies. And one time he flew down there to see what the land looked like and someone recognized him. And they said, are you Walt Disney? And he said, heck no, I'm not Walt Disney. And if I ever meet the guy, I'm going to punch him in the nose. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, because if they knew that Walt was on the prowl for more land, they would have jacked that price up, right? And he wanted more land because with Disneyland, what happened was people started building things right outside the gates. And he didn't want that to happen when he built Epcot. And he wasn't really interested in building Disney World. He wanted to build Epcot. But he had to agree to build Disney World to get the rights to build Epcot. He he didn't want government involved so he could have all these technologies there. And that's that's what this was all about. Because they didn't build Epcot as a city. I think all that should have been forfeited years ago. They just exploited what Walt set up for a different reason. And uh, let me just finish what all we have here. Uh, Mm -hmm. He did one more film. It was filmed the same day. So I don't know which one was the last one. It's in our links. It was for uh, Follow Me Boys was going to premiere at Radio City Music Hall that December. He couldn't go because of his he was sick with this operation, surgeries and all that. So he did this film and he's there talking about how he can't get away from the studio. And it's the last time he was ever filmed. You get a little misty eyed seeing that when you realize he's, he's going to die after this. But that was the last, these two films were the last time he was, he was ever filmed. I'm just making sure I got all the technologies here. Cause I had oh, 20,000 people were going to live in Epcot when, if it was built the way Walt 20, wanted 20,000. Wow. 20,000. And he says in the video, in the film, there'll be no homeless people in Epcot and all of them will be employed. So there's another reason they probably wouldn't like that. <laughs> But even though everything in there, all the, the stuff was uh, electricity, it was run off that nuclear power plant. So you st- even though, like today, they're trying to do electric stuff, electric vehicles, they're not doing anything with the power grid that will make the, enough power to, because the, the objective is you're not going to tra- travel anywhere. That We all know that. Mm-hmm. But Walt <laughs> Smart was, city, baby. Yeah, Walt, city. 
yeah. Well, this would have been better than a 15 minute city. This was right, the answer right. to the 15 minute city. And all through this video, this film, Walt talks about American in ingenuity, creativity, the value of free enterprise, and they were all going to go into building Epcot. And you don't hear that stuff anymore. You know? No, you do not, sadly. And I got my little notes here in the end of why he didn't it didn't get built. Uh, I think I might have said, oh, when they built Disney World, it was going to be built in four phases, and Epcot was supposed to be phase two. And when they built it, it was the uh, biggest uh, private uh, construction project that was ever done. I don't know if it still is, but it was at that time. And the reason there's all the tunnels under Disney World, that's because when they were going to build Epcot, all those vehicles and things were going to be underneath the city. Mm -hmm. So that and Walt didn't want people to see like the garbage man going through with garbage. So you would he pick up the garbage in the park, go down one of these little entrances and go underneath the park. And that's how this was. This was all applied to Disney World. And uh, I guess that's the story of Epcot. I wish they would yeah. build it. Me and, too, man. God. And well, I was really counting on people coming to see Epcot. There was going to be a visitor center and even at an airport in the in that map. They had Good an airport at the bottom. I mean. This was you could see why he wanted his own uh, leniencies from the government so he could do all these things because there were no no regulations. How well, big would it have been as far as square miles? Do you have I any think, idea? I think he well, it's the same land that's there, but it would have filled up the whole property. They only fill up a little part of it now with the theme parks, but I think he said it was going to be three or four times the size of Manhattan. <sighs> okay, well, and if, if he hadn't if, smoked, we would have yeah, had Epcot. Yeah, that's. I know. Okay, and when you say three or four times the size of Manhattan, uh, here's another, uh, I guess, uh, analogy. If you've ever been to DFW Airport, it is larger than the island of Manhattan. So is that the it one takes in, a long time to drive. Huh? Is that the one in uh, Colorado? Dallas, They're always no, having No, Dallas-Fort Worth, DFW. Okay. Yeah. Well, and I know so, there's the one on all the conspiracies about it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, yeah, that's Denver. But what I'm saying is <laughs> DFW Airport is so massive. Yeah. Three or four of those, and, and obviously it's an airport. Yeah, <laughs> it's a large airport. You could have gotten a lot. Uh, well, this was 1966. Uh, he was going to build. He he did this video, yeah. so Man. it probably would have opened 70, 71, if, as he'd planned it. And he had the, he had the same Disneyland planners behind it. Admiral Joe Fowler was the one that ended up building Disney World for Roy, but he was the one who was planning Epcot with Walt. He'd have meetings mm -hmm. in his office while they were making the films, and Walt said that he was going to back off on his control on the films because he he was going to just focus on epcot and trust all of his people to make the films i don't know if that would have worked out because that's kind of what happened after he died and some of those films got to be mediocre the farther away we get from when walt died mm -hmm. all right do you want to go to dave smith dave, here now dave smith he, he what happened with dave smith he, roy realized after walt died a lot of the other employees were passing away or leaving the co the company and the legacy of the studio was going to go away because you couldn't go down the hall to ask somebody about what was it like when they did Mickey Mouse or Snow White. Mm -hmm. So they mm -hmm. announced they were going to have a Disney archive. And th this ha this was at a time when the other studios were burning all of their archives and films. They're getting rid of the props and everything. There was a famous what? MGM Studios had an auction where they sold off all the props. What is so that? I don't understand that line of thinking. So this was the opposite. And Dave Smith was working as an archivist at UCLA. He was compiling a bibliography on Walt Disney. He heard about Roy wanting an archive. So he applied for the job, was hired in 1970. And his first job was to catalog the contents of Walt's office. Uh, then he began uh, gathering up artifacts that chronicled everything from the Disney family genealogy to the founding of the company. He attempted to preserve everything of Walt's papers, awards, memorabilia, he uh, made recommendations uh, how to establish an archive. And after this archive was established, other archives for other companies, they followed the same template. And he was there for 40 years. Man, but Smart yeah, move by Roy, huh? Yeah, but near the end, the, the wokeness started to creep in because they would start. He, uh, Dave Smith was still alive when they started erasing the cigarette and the photos with Walt. And they now they started, uh, you can't have corporate <laughs> sponsor photos. There he is with some of those Mickey Mouse comic strip books there on the left. Oh, cool. Yeah. And cool. Uh, he he uh, 
that you can't have images of the photo release of the balloon releases anymore. If you remember those when we were a kid, that goes all the way back to when Walt was alive. They'd re release the balloons because environmentalists don't like it, ESG and all that. And I, I think uh, the woke folders next. Yeah, I can't. Now, wait these, for this. Well, these are stills from that website they have up that's called uh, Stories Matter, and. That's these are where they complain about the Aristocats. They have the Chinese cat. Oh, like that. Let it go, y'all. Come on. This was if you read this stuff, it's not even correct because they say that the, the crows are, are making fun of black people. They were voiced by black people. Uh, and, the, and the Indians and Peter Pan, they call them Native Americans, but it's not America. It's Neverland. So how are they Native Americans? They're just Indians. Uh, Who's to yeah. say what uh, uh, Indians in Neverland look like? We debunked that one a few weeks ago with Swiss Family Robinson. They try to say those pirates are all people in white face or, or black face and Asian face and all that stuff. And it's not true. These are the people, the companies they're working with, the organizations that are behind all this stuff where they're banning everything. Every one of them is a radical Marxist leftist group. <laughs> Surprise. Yeah. Oh, more. Gina Davis. Glad. And, and this is the, the, the stuff that uh, leaked a few weeks ago about uh, their hiring practices and all that. And equity right. And all. Tell it's, us about that, all, would you? They want to have 50% minority people in animation, and there's not that many in the pool of animation to work with. So and, it's no longer a meritocracy. It's it's what color is your skin and uh, what is your uh, sexual preference? And and, and the that. films reflect that because they what are your uh, pronouns. What are your pronouns? In fact, I heard from someone. Uh, it's obviously it's not just Disney, but I heard from everywhere. someone today um, that was trying to apply for a job at the Blaze. I got this little note this morning. It says the first time they've applied. Uh, I don't know how many dozens of jobs that they weren't asked what their pronouns were. Well, I, I on uh, Twitter, I've posted some of the uh, applications for working in animation, and they all ask you questions like this, and they want to know your sexuality and your race and your gender and pronouns and all that. Or they won't, And if you don't fill out the way they wanted, the application ends at that step because you got to sign up online everywhere now. They don't even want to look at your stuff. They just want that. And They that want you to check a box for them. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> and they've gone and recruited people online that are these... Uh, woke uh, activists that are posting artwork that's terrible online they they bring them in and hire them to work in the animated f features and that's what's going on now at disney this stuff is so gross man Ugh. That but that, this is all uh, in in a lot of the books and things they have a link to this website that story matters and this is what's there and they only care what people look like and sexuality and all that stuff they don't care what they do look at that learn more about people and dei nah and I'm not the, gonna do that. I also have about uh, the the uh, with the Disney archives. Now they only will allow approved historians access to the Disney archives, and they call oh, them. Oh my word! Yeah, I think they, I've heard Glenn Beck talking about. They that. call them pixie dusters, and they're spreading pixie dusts, which is I call approved BS. Uh -huh. And uh, the Disney archives, I am aware they know we're doing these shows, so. <laughs> Hi. Oh, oh, how about some, some Walt quotes, huh? Yep. I wanted to have Walt have a say here. And yes, these are, thank you. <laughs> these are just some of the quotes that he. I, I found these all online, and I have some that I'll read off too that uh, I d couldn't find online. They're in hard books. Oh, you but, know what? Uh, actually, speaking of Glenn Beck, when he sends an email, it's got that quote right there at the bottom. Oh yeah. Of his, uh, well, uh, now you know, know where it comes from. I, I just remember seeing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, Glenn. I hope you're watching. <laughs> I wonder how many things that we've talked about he didn't know about because he knows a lot about Walt. Yeah. Definitely. You know, children's are our greatest access. Oh my master. gosh. Oh my gosh. That quote has come back to haunt when invo involving Disney now. How ironic. Yeah, our greatest natural resource is the minds of our children. Walt Disney. They've totally yeah, perverted well, it. And now, now under his name, look at what they're doing to the minds of our children. Wow. Well, th they uh, announced that uh, the new Disney Legends, and uh, most of them are PC woke PR BS people. Mm. And uh, Miley Cyrus is one of the people who uh, they're making a Disney Legend now. And you remember, she just flies in the face of all of the values <laughs> of Walt. 
That's and uh, Mark Henn was an animator. He they kind of forced him out of the company, and he's made he's the only one on there that I recognize that should be a Disney legend. All the other people are, are people from television and everything today. It's all PC PR move. And uh, I would like to see Hazel George made into a Disney legend. We talked about her last week. Mm-hmm. Now, th- this is a great one here. All the things that he faced and that made him a stronger person. And these are things that people should hear. A kick in the teeth may be the best thing in the world for you. <laughs> yeah. And now we, we coddle everything. Yeah. And why, why worry if you've done your best? You know, all your dreams come true if you pursue them. Now, see, they focus a lot on the fantasy aspects of Walt. They don't talk about he had to do things to make his dreams happen. The hard work. The hard work. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> nice. And that's because he had people around him that knew how to do things, and they used all this American ingenuity. And they always quote that one, but they don't talk about doing it. <laughs> Just dream. That, he said this it. in World War II. Once a man's tasted freedom, he'll never be content to be a slave. And the next one, I have the whole quote. And uh, he just goes through the whole thing. Always thankful that uh, he lives in America and and uh, we're, he, everyone in the world wants to live like we do and be free and everything. Yeah, I'm going to read that. Once a man okay. has tasted freedom, he will never be content to be a slave. That is why I believe that this frightfulness we see everywhere today is only temporary. Tomorrow will be better for as long as America keeps alive the ideals of freedom and a better life. All men will want to be free and share our way of life. There must be so much that I should have said but haven't. What I will say now is just what most of us are probably thinking every day. I thank God and America for the right to live and raise my family under the flag of tolerance, democracy, and freedom. Walt Disney. Wow. And you and said that, that was during World War II? Yeah, and that speaks to today, a lot of those uh, comments. It, it, that was, absolutely. That, it does. That's that was, was out of that was out of that paragraph, but that speaks to today. That you know yeah. it's this might all be temporary. Mm-hmm. And I have a couple I'm gonna read off. Now okay. I've got one here from 1957. He said about Disneyland, and he said there's an American theme behind Disneyland, I believe, in emphasizing the story of what made America great and what will keep it great. And remember, we're wow. we're told that's a racist thing to say. He said <laughs> Disneyland is sort of a monument to the American way of life. Now, this one you you'll never see in a quote book on Walt. Certainly, I believe in romance. The love a boy has for a girl is natural. Now, today you can't say that. <laughs> And he said, I always wanted to retain my individuality. And here's this quote on animation. Animation can explain whatever the mind of man can conceive. This facility makes it the most versatile and explicit means of communication yet devised for quick mass appreciation. And that, that's been exploited on pushing this woke stuff today. That's the last quote I have. Now I have to just have some okay. photos of, uh, well, these are some of the books that, People ask me what books to get. We talked about that one. Oh yeah, okay, cool. I, All right, everybody. Yeah, right. I just down. made a. These are ones that aren't very expensive, and I have them all on hand here. Uh, but uh, that's the one about Bill Peake, his autobiography. Mm-hmm. Uh, that one came out when I was a kid, and it's uh, this one here. I was in fifth grade. That was written for children. It's not a children's book. It's a decent sized biography yeah the man to, behind the magic if you want to introduce your children to who walt was that mm-hmm. that was the first book on animation i ever got and that was when beauty and the beast came out art of animation uh-huh and uh, that's written by the same guy who did and they, they did an update with hercules but that was by <laughs> the same guy who did uh the the uh, one in the 50s for sleeping beauty that's so expensive to get that was a, my second book with animation i just read that page to page over and over and over uh, to tie in with that, when I was a kid, they used to do magazines of the animated features when they came out. That's my Aladdin one I got when I went grocery shopping with my grandma. <laughs> now, this this Snow White one, that came out around that time, but there's three different covers for that, but they're all the same contents. There was a version that came out in the 80s, and there was that one. This one here came out in 96, and I wrote my first good story using the template in that book. Okay. And, uh, there's an update of that, but I prefer the original. 
that's the the bible of animation the illusion of life this is the first edition of that <laughs> oh wow very cool i man. found that in an antique store oh nice they only wanted, they only wanted 30 dollars for it so i said i yes. love finds like that man love it, it. Was near, it was near my birthday too this is that book here. This this was put out by the Disney family, and uh, there's there were a couple books, and it has just people telling stories about them, and that's what that book is as well. That's Remembering bit, Walt and Inside the yeah, Dream. Uh -huh. That's a little bit bigger, but uh, just inside, just people giving their memories. That's probably the best Walt Disney biography ever done, and that one, uh, it's not an official biography, but the people who wrote it, they interviewed people who knew Walt. That's the documentary the Disney family put out, now, I've seen it on uh, streaming, and it's edited on streaming now. Of course it is. Of course, because why would you want to tell the whole truth? But that's the DVD version that's the complete version. Okay. All right. Let's see. Where to next? Are we going to finale? Right? Well, I have, the, I have oh. Disney folders. I, I can do the or photos. I can do the finale. The finale is a little story no, you, I wrote. You, you tell me where to go. You want me to go to Disney Picks? Is that what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, we can go there. This is the okay. family. That's cool. Because the story of <laughs> Disney is a story of this family. And mm -hmm. you just bring them up there, and I'll tell you who you're looking at. Because there's parallels between now and then. Now, that's with the Firehouse 5 Plus 2, Walt, sitting there with the band. I don't think <laughs> I showed that one before, so I put that one in there. Um, that's Walt with Burl Lives on the set of Summer Magic. <laughs> uh, I thought that was a great photo. I found that, that after... Is. Live action show, so now that's Walt with a photo of him when he was young. Then he just invented Mickey with Ub Iwerks. Walt with all the characters. Oh, I'm sorry, that one's a small one, uh, but it was a great photo. And that's Walt with Roy when they started out, and then I have one, and that's when they got the Oscar for creating Mickey Mouse. And this was them when they're working on the, Disney's working on the Jungle Book right before Walt died, and it was really because of Roy. A lot of this stuff got preserved because he always took care of Walt when they were growing up. And he, when Walt was gone, he still took care of wrapping things up. And this, this is going to uh, tie into a photo later, but that's almost like that statue they made where he's sitting there with Minnie, but that's Mickey. That's Walt star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame, but it's there for television. It's not there for films. That's Walt with his daughters and their their dog that he would feed the hot dogs that we talked about last week. <laughs> That's on the his daughter getting married there. His daughter, she started the Walt Disney Family Museum, but I've unfortunately been seeing online that they've been hiring people that push this woke ideology. So I don't have that's his daughter Diane there that started the museum. I don't have faith in that. That's with Ron Miller, her husband, that took over after Walt died in the studio end. But I, I'm concerned that they're going to ruin the museum as well and i've talked to people and they've said that they're they're afraid that at some point the museum's going to merge with the disney company yeah. so then they'll be controlling that because she started the museum to keep it away from the disney company because she wanted people to know who her father was and he mm -hmm. wasn't this he wasn't like like colonel sanders he's become like colonel sanders because people don't realize colonel sanders is a real guy you can go on you youtube and you can see interviews with colonel sanders talking about his life his christian faith and different things and people just think of him as being the mascot for a food company restaurant where where is this walt disney family museum located do you know i think san francisco mm -hmm. and i was told by someone when when uh, glenn with the, that's john lassiter that uh, they did a thing celebrating him but they probably won't anymore but uh glenn beck went there and the people who were working at the museum they just freaked out online that glenn went there it was like you would have thought he was wiping crap on the walls <laughs> that's what somebody that's what they actually said somebody actually made oh that comment gosh. and it's always stuck with me uh, and now this is uh roy jr with uh, his wife and his mother and roy senior's dad and we have th roy to thank for a lot of this stuff not getting lost because he lived till 2009 yeah. and he put a lot of it out on dvd <clears throat> he controlled things that happened at the studio because they they he wouldn't let them do things that uh went against the uh, uh values of his family because that was his family name, and he didn't want anything to happen to tarnish it. So, how old was okay? How old was Roy when he died? Do you have any idea? I think he was seventy-nine, but I'll, I'd have to look it up. How many extra years would that have given Walt? Well, most most of the people yeah. in Walt's family lived to be in their eighties, and Walt Gosh, died at sixty-five, so he would have yeah. made it. 
Mm-hmm. That's Walt with Mickey. I had that one with his dad with Mickey. This is a a parallel of that. That's when they were working on Oliver and Company, I think. But he was really the face of Disney when uh, he was alive because he was the only Disney there. And now that he's gone, his uh, daughter is that Abigail Disney that's always smearing Walt and Roy Sr. and everything. And it only started happening after he, uh, Roy Jr. passed away. So I don't know if there's some family feud thing going on there or something, but... Uh, when Roy got fired from Disney, they used the agent against him. He started Save Disney. And that's what this is from. They actually are selling the bumper stickers at auctions now as part of Disney history. This was Roy having a, me- a, a press conference about it. And I wanted to get Song of the South in there one more time because that was the one thing <laughs> Roy didn't get to put out. But he was working on that. The year he died, he put out the True Life Adventures on DVD. That was the last thing he did, but he was going to do Song of the South. Roy Jr., Right. Yeah, Roy Jr. Mm-hmm. But people were always mixing him up with his father. Which folder to next, sir? What, what, what do you have there? I have... Uh, I have... I'm looking at Herman something. Well, I, can, I don't know how to say his last name either, but I, what I was going to say about him uh-huh. was he was a camera operator at Disney in 30s and 40s, and his hobby was f- photography, and he documented what happened behind the scenes at Disney on Fantasia, Pinocchio, Dumbo, Bambi, and the Reluctant Dragon. And Disney wasn't doing this. The company wasn't. And he tried to sell his, he did a workbook of how he did all these effects on those films. And he tried to sell it to Walt in the studio and they weren't interested. And what his, how his story ends is he ends up getting lost in the jungle and dies. Oh gosh. But his widow saved all these photos. He took all through California of that time period. And what ended up happening was after his widow passed away, the, the, the see, that's where they were going to build the, the Disney studios. Oh, he t- he documented all this when he died. The, uh, the Walt's daughter, Diane bought them for the family. He, she bought all the stuff for the family <clears throat> museum and they put it out in a, in a book you can get through the museum. And it's all of uh, the, the, I don't have any scannings of the photos cause they take up such a whole, huge page. Uh, he disappeared taking photos in Guatemala and they found him in the jungle later, his, his remains. But why I wanted to mention that was this is a story of somebody who was documenting everything just because he had a camera. He wasn't trying to mm-hmm. preserve history. And now because he did that, we have all this record of history. And that's, that's so cool. That's true about people going to the theme park and they took fil- films in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s. They were doing family films. But now there's a record of what it was like at that time. And that's like we have that nativity video from Walt Disney World. Mm-hmm. And people recorded things on television back in the 80s. And they're posting those <laughs> on YouTube now. So there's I records know. of those things. And so th- these are some things you can do for Disney history is collect these things that are posted online. And another thing that happened was there was an animator named Randy Cartwright in the 80s. He went through the studio and filmed everything with his camera because he just wanted to film with the camera. End up having he created a time capsule of what it was like right before Eisner took over, and what the studio was like before they kicked everyone out. And uh, wh- where do we want to go to next? I have. Well, uh, let me ask you this oh. here: um, Do we want to open it up for some questions that maybe people have had over the last twelve weeks? Oh, we, we can do that. that. that they want to ask you here uh, in the chat. Uh, we have a few minutes here and see if anybody comes there and then after that you want to do the finale folder after we get some questions here well the finale is a story but i wanted to mention oh, okay what happened how we're paralleling what happened with the 70s with disney okay all right but i can do um, that when we're for our finale so i'll tell you what y'all um get your questions ready uh and then and, and then we'll go through them ed how about that so where, right. what folder do you want me to open up here while people are typing well, up their questions you want to do the finale one where i have the story i'll tell the story i did a it's okay. tied in with this tied in with save disney save disney when it was out they had a uh, fairy tale about the goose that laid the golden eggs and now it was forced to ra- raise uh, rotten eggs I went through Walt's films and I made a little parable about woke Disney. And I, this, okay. was gonna, this was going to be in an earlier show. So okay. this is once upon a time in a faraway land, there was a magic kingdom. So you can just click to the mm-hmm. next one. Wait, we need the, we need the Tinkerbell little. Ding. Oh, yeah. I think, I think you need to go. Ding. 
No, I'm not going to do that. Okay. So, so it's a faraway <laughs> land. And the good, oh, oh the, the words are going to be on the screen for me. Oh, there's no words. Oh, okay. that, uh, this that's just from Cinderella. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, uh, yeah, just go to the next one. The good mm -hmm. king that ruled the, the magic kingdom, he passed away. Oh no! And that's the kingdom cool, was. Right? Yep, this is the kingdom. See, I got that. And it was eventually taken over by the queen oh, of wokeness. No. Oh, she put the good, princess bro. of values to sleep. <laughs> she took over the throne of the magic kingdom. Oh, I hate that. Ugh. The pirates came to invade her the kingdom. They worked for the queen. Yeah. Then she went on a rampage. Yes. She locked away the fairy of truth. Preach. She enslaved all the characters. Oh, no. I just have a couple there where they're getting this enslaved. Not, this is not good. I'm getting nervous. <laughs> and uh, mm. she banished the conscience of traditional morality. There it is. Yeah, see? Not happy. And those who refused to join her woke agenda, they were banished from the kingdom. They had to walk the plank. Yes, there walk it the is. <laughs> then the mask there. came off. Oh, <laughs> oh, no. Not good. And now it's the tragic kingdom. Yes, it is. And the pirates celebrated. They had taken over the kingdom. Ugh. And that, that's the tragic kingdom. And the go and Her goons took over the kingdom, and they summoned the demon of wokeness, Chernabog. <laughs> Oh my goodness. And Chernabog invited all the unblessed spirits of the culture to join him. <laughs> and he gradually contorted and twisted the beloved characters into hideous monstrosities. Oh, and God. all seemed forgotten. <laughs> this is a nightmare. Until the, the first light of truth broke free. And you see, this is where they, he contorted the women in that. Uh, and, I yeah. yeah. I got a little ahead of it. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, no, that's okay. okay. All right, what do we got here? What's the next line? Well, the next one is Chernabog's defeated. If you remember right on Bald Mountain, it was the sunlight coming up, and that's what defeated Chernabog. Uh -huh. It was the church the church bells rang too. So he gets defeated, and then this the queen runs away and the dwarfs chase her down everything. The the fairies released. Uh they pulled the, the sword from the stone. Who's gonna <laughs> Wokeness Who's going to fill that role? I don't know. This is what might happen. This wokeness, is what might happen, right? <laughs> wokeness can't defeat, can't uh, face the light, and that's why it does everything it does in darkness. Now, this is how all the knowledge was saved away from the Magic Kingdom. So now right it can the, come back. On this playlist at youtubecom yeah. at the mic with key. It was it was for, fortunately preserved by the Wizard of Knowledge. <laughs> I love it. It's good stuff. And, he, and they find the slumbering Princess of Values and awaken her. And the fairy truth was set free. They put the. Are we the, gonna live happily ever after? We might. We I don't might. know. We might. We might get there. They all rejoice as the prince uh, awakens her, and they, he takes her back to the castle. Yay and stuff. <laughs> and I showed that. I told this to the woke Dis or the saved Disney guy, and he thought this was fantastic. <laughs> this is good stuff, man. Okay. <laughs> Let me uh, let me get over here and take a look if we've got any questions that have come up. Uh, let's see. The Wombat Mommy, uh, she says, the Donald Duck cartoon that has the spirit of invention. I can't remember. Oh, there we go. I can't remember what it, what it's called. And why can't I don't remember. I don't remember the title, but it was uh, done with. Uh, it's the 1939 World's Fair. I'll put that out when I find the title today. Okay. But uh, I know I know which one you're talking about, and that, that that was the first one I think Carl Barks worked on. I'm just scrolling around here to see if there's any questions. Uh, add your questions in here in the chat if you have any that you've been, you know, uh, rolling around in your brain over the last twelve weeks here with Ed and his presentations. Uh, I'm just scrolling around here. Okay. While you, while you're doing that, I'll say what happened last time with the '70s when Walt died. Where I think that kind of storytelling went, it went to mm -hmm. the the Rankin Bass Christmas specials. No, it's, it's that's a different one, but that okay. that they, those are so the it's spirits. Not, it's not Donald and the Wheel as that. Uh, those are the spirits of uh, of uh, invention. It's not the okay. it's not the same one. It's it's okay. Uh, I hope and I'm what not... were you saying about the 70s? Well, the Rank and Bass Christmas specials is where that kind of storytelling went with the songs and the characters and the entertainment and everything. 
It went to the Rankin Bass Christmas specials in the 70s. And you also had other studios. They were making films compared with Walt. Star Wars was compared with the Disney film when it first came out, the original Star Wars. And films in the 80s, like Ghostbusters, Back to the Future, Hook and all those, those are pretty much Walt Disney films. If you take out the swearing and the sexual innuendo, it just uh, it follows that template. You, you start in reality, then you by the end, you're in a fantasy at the end. Okay. But All right. A lot of those people grew up watching Walt's films. That's why they made those films. Maybe that'll happen again. We're 15 years in the cycle since Roy died, and that's about where those films came about after Walt died. So if we go by that, we're 15 years into the cycle, and it took about 20 years to get Disney back on track again after Walt died. Uh, let's see. I have another folder here. Do you have, um, well, there's we want to go to the Ed folder. If you want to, that's just because people don't know what I do. So I put that in there. Yeah, no, no, no. This is perfect. This is a great way to end this because a lot of people, you're absolutely right, Ed. They may have been watching. It's like, who's this head guy? What does he do? You know? So <laughs> let's do this. Um, I want us to go through this last folder here. This, uh, uh, let's see, boy, a lot of stuff here. So go through this folder and then any parting thoughts you have for people that have been watching, uh, over the last 12 weeks here. So let me, uh, yeah, I have, I have parting thoughts when we're done with the folder. Okay. All right. Fire away, sir. Well, it just is bring them up there. This is, this is what I used to do in high school. I used to make uh plywood figures of all the Disney characters and I made 2,500 oh. of them. 2,500. Yeah. From age 13 till I started college. Now, those so are my first could... ones, so they're not that good. So hang on a second. Is that is that you uh, standing? Yeah, on yeah, that's zone? me. I, yeah, oh, cool. I'm wearing I'm wearing a Mighty so... Ducks jacket. <laughs> <laughs> so you, um, uh, a Disney property, right? Yeah, so you, it uh, was. You you obviously do a lot of uh, woodwork then as well, huh? Well, I did back then, back but then, I yeah. I became okay. an expert with that. The, the story with this is the the high school wanted a Cinderella dance. And I didn't really, I wasn't going to build Cinderella. It wasn't a favorite film of mine because boys don't really <laughs> like Cinderella. But uh, by the time we were all done, I had got them to build all the characters. Uh, and then I got to keep them when we were done. They paid for the supplies. This is another year. I I put these in my yard at, at Christmas time. Oh, and cool. uh, that cathedral in the background is 16 feet tall in the top photo. For oh, the wait. For the Hunchback of Notre Dame. Oh, gosh. Yeah. And it stood in our property, my parents' property. So I, you know, maybe 10 years ago, it finally blew over. <laughs> uh, that was, uh, if you, you look there, Walt's, I have a, a figure of Walt in the background. He's holding uh -huh. hands with Mickey Mouse, Tinkerbell's there. Uh, that was in 96. I made the Hercules characters based on the film trailer. It was on the Toy Story VHS. So they're very off model there. But I remade a lot of this stuff later when I got real good at uh, woodworking. There's the Walt uh, wooden figure. I did Walt's uh, wooden figure twice. And, and I did uh, fixing these, like the, the a wand for the fairy godmother. It had a light bulb on the end, so it would light up. And oh, people, nice. I'm, people I want, would come through. Okay. I, I, I want to call you Aladdin Elgin now. Yeah. Well, that was, I saw what they did there. <sighs> I, I don't have any inspirations to work for Disney anymore. I lost that oh, yeah. when I was in college. Uh -huh. That's me at the library talking about how I built the wooden figures. And I did uh, the seven dwarfs showing all the different stages of them of painting them and cutting them out and sanding everything. This got me in the paper in high school. I did a, everyone else in our art class, we had to do ABCs. So they were doing like A's for apple, B's for baby. I did the ABCs of the Clinton impeachment. Oh and, no. And it's I all in rhyme. Dress. It's all in rhyme. I can't I believe some of the things they printed there. Cause I have Monica stained dress there. I saw that. Yeah. And I there's the, uh, I have Ron Brown getting murdered. <laughs> oh my God. Goodness, I missed the Ron Brown. Uh, he's uh, somewhere. Oh, he's there. Uh, the, the third from the bottom left. Gosh. And yeah. it's all in rhyme. And my, my art teacher asked me if I created that because she wanted to tr call the newspaper. And I, I'm glad I told her I did because I thought I was going to be in trouble. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> Those are just some of the other figures I made. And these are all That's larger funny. than life size. Oh, wow. I don't have any larger photos available. So that's why they're, they're kind of small. Yeah. But. Boy, how long did one of these take you from start to oh, finish? Oh, I'd have them going on multiple ones at a time, but they took a little over a month to do each character. Golly, bro. Oh, I don't know how I got out of that. You, you were left off at Beauty and the Beast. Yeah, I'll get back in there. 
Okay. But I, uh, I, I got better at it as I went. It was the okay. last two, two years, two, three, two or three years that I was really good at it. The first ones are, I didn't put a lot of the first ones in there, but uh, I, I kind of wish that I had uh, built a house instead. <laughs> <laughs> Well, back then, plywood wasn't that expensive either. Yeah, that's true. I, I think it was like $8 a sheet. or Most I think I ever spent was 15 And uh, what happened with these wooden figures is I was in college. And that's at that dance with Cinderella with all the characters. Now I had a weekend mm -hmm. to make the uh, stepmother and stepsisters. Mm -hmm. This is my high school graduation party. And I took over a church with all the wooden figures. And what were you saying happened to the wooden figures? When I was in college, the I uh, the place we lived next we lived next to was a cemetery, and the caretakers left a brush fire go, and they all got burned up. And I had to argue with the town, and I didn't get any compensation. They blamed it on me. Oh, th this is when I was having a fight with my zoning officer in college. I went and I made a life size ceramic statue of Ned Flanders from The Simpsons. And this is, these are, I was in parades with some of these wooden figures. These are all Christmas characters from uh, Rudolph and Frosty, the snowman, Santa Claus is coming to town. There's Man, a, I am sorry about that fire. Oh. Oh. I, those, these are the ones I wished I hadn't a loss because those were the last ones I made that were, uh, that's me in a Santa suit there. And I sat in the sleigh mm -hmm. and rode on the parade float. I won the, the parade float like six times. Six, every year mm -hmm. I did it. Um, How did you, man, I, I can't get over that fire. How, well, how did you react to that? Not not well, I would imagine. I wasn't happy. When it, yeah, the, I had to deal with local politics and all this stuff. And and they didn't compensate you for their nope. error? They tried to blame me for it, for storing it in the way of their fire. Now, this one is, I didn't have pictures. Well, of time out, time out, time out. The city wanted to, they blamed you for storing it in the way of their fire? Yeah. And they could have burned the house down. My dad worked third shift at that time, and he was sleeping in the house. It was on your and, property, yeah. right? And it, it burned up like a third of the property because they walked away from this brush fire. Okay. I don't understand this. Word. Well, like Walt said, getting a kick in the teeth sometimes. <laughs> now, with that last one there, oh, I was going to mention, I, I these are my some of my Christmas figures. I had them out for a photo. But I have a lot of Disney characters. I have thousands of them from all over the world, but I don't collect them anymore. I just... Stop the collection when everything went woke. And this is when I was in college. I did uh, a Jill Chill animated film with stop motion puppets. Jill Chill. You will hear more about Jill Chill in the future, I am convinced. Uh, well, I hope so. Uh -huh. and, and I was trying to make it look like one of those specials on TV, and I had the castle built out. It, uh, the mountain was made out of flower pots with plaster on them. This is one of the puppets uh -huh. I made of the villain's sidekick. It's got a very um, uh, Rudolph feel. To well, it. that's what I was old, going old for because I looked around in the '70s. No one ever. Well, pause at that last photo. I looked around oh. how in the '90s how no one was making anything like these Christmas specials anymore, and I wanted to see if I could do something like that. And that's how the Jill Chill thing got started. Mm -hmm. I didn't know I was creating a lifelong thing, but this was the rejected version I illustrated. Uh huh. <laughs> I had the characters interacting with the texts of the original story. They had a different artist do it, and they didn't do it this way. But that's just why I put it in there because you won't see that anywhere. And that was me selling Jill Chill books. And right. I had Jill Chill wooden figures. I carried them around with me at these shows. And I built that doll on the table of Jill Chill. So do you sell these books uh, currently? If well, they're out of, to buy these? out of print now. I'm working on getting things okay. back into print you again. Keep us updated, bro. Oh, I will. That's <laughs> me. My friend that owned our local drive-in theater, he was he knew a lot about Walt Disney. We always shared a lot of interest in Walt, and he went on that uh, this parade with me with the Jill Chill stuff. And uh, ha, that, there you are, the me radio. promoting it. Yeah, he he pat the the guy in the previous photo. He passed away just before COVID. Uh, and that was the that, comic bro. book I did. I didn't do the artwork, but you see those those were the puppets there. The one little puppet I had, he's on the right there. That was based on my artwork. This is the one I'm working on right now. After the, I get Jill Chill relaunched, I've been working on Folked Up America. And it's a it's a tall tale. Of, and I have all these characters. These are the woke characters that replace the tall tale characters we know. Progressive what would Jesus. Progressive Jesus do. Or PJ. <laughs> it's all good. This is, this is the lo logo for the American Legion of Liberals. We are a legion. They keep changing their name. <laughs> they change it to the leftists. Now, this That's one a I. That's a freaking man's joke there. 
I came up with this in 2008 and I put it online and I've seen them actually use this lo logo with the fist and the feminist thing. I put those oh. together myself and I put a coat hanger there because that's what they're for, a rusty coat hanger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they've adopted it as a real symbol. Yeah. That, that's just some concept art I did. That's a, uh, I did a, uh, there's one of the little short stories. It's like a schoolhouse rock and I did the road to socialism. This is Casey, the mighty Casey at the bat. I'm, I want to put some of this stuff on t-shirts and mugs. Some of these yeah. American characters. And this is one of the pages from it that I was working on. And he's a character raised from American folklore in real life. And that's one of the other pages. Just to give Good. you an idea of how I draw things. I don't, I can't draw like a, a, the, the way that they do the fancy Disney things now, but uh, that's so nice. Uh, that's good stuff, man. And and keep us updated on your progress with that, uh, Jill Chill, and and all of that fun stuff there. So, uh, what I'm giving you the last word. This has been your baby. This has been more <laughs> than 24 hours with Ed, as we've done 12 episodes, uh, roughly two hours each. Just um, the history of Walt Disney, his company, where it went off the rails over the years. I mean, it's, it's a decline that's been going on for decades, as, as we've learned. Yeah. We've talked about um, uh, things that never happened, the Disney that never was. I mean, there's been so much covered. Walt's faith. Um, it's just just amazing information. That and there's still more with. we could have talked about. <laughs> and, and that's that's where Rediscovering Walt Disney comes yeah. in. And I, and I hope that uh, you will put that stuff there and we can track the progress uh, uh, as you move along here and, and, and detail everything. So any any final thoughts well, that you want to share with everybody? Today? Well, what I, I hope people got out of seeing these is that there's more to Walt Disney than just the cartoons. He did uh, the television, the live action films, city planning, theme parks, uh, what his personal side was, all that stuff. You got to know... He, he didn't do this stuff alone. He surrounded himself with people who did these things. So that's why we spent so much time. Probably fourth of the shows are just people he collaborated with. Because mm -hmm. that's all forgotten. If you want to fix this wokeness stuff, you're going to have to have, you got to get all the wokeness out of the company. And uh, they promote people from within the company. Because you've got this whole ideology now that's in there, like a cancer now, that's ruined the whole thing. And you have to fix it. And that's the only way you're going to be able to fix it is if you get uh, new people in there that are that have the same shared mindset that's going to rebuild it and it got, it got rebuilt again because it when the 70s and everything that it was really bleak then and it came around for a time but then the executives ruined everything and then roy passed away and now we're where we are now and the woke disney they have no op optimism now walt chose stories where he could inspire uh, children and families they re reinforced traditional values sometimes they told history they dramatized important stories and events uh, he always tried to shape children in the in the culture in positive ways. And the woke Disney, they only focus on the fantasy aspects of Walt. They take away the American ingenuity. They uh, only make films that push an agenda now. They feel they're morally superior to thousands of years of time-tested traditions and values. Mm -hmm. And Walt's stuff all made a time capsule of that. And uh, I just... Hope people come to appreciate it. a lot of the lies that are out there about them. We debunked with the Freemasonry and all that. Cause I see a lot of that <laughs> coming yeah. along and uh, we need more people like Walt Disney. And I, what, what might happen is other studios will come up now and uh, kind of restore that. And then they'll go back into Disney because John Lasseter is working at a new studio. Now, and a lot of the people that have left woke Disney, they're working at that studio now. And there are a lot of the people that were there in the eighties and nineties and the early two thousands. And yeah. uh, the, the thing I closed with in our links is I have the uh, end of the Mickey Mouse Club where they'd always sing the song and you'd be real sad because you're not coming back. Right, right. But you're all friends at the end. So, <laughs> but uh, we c couldn't so, hear that. But Yeah, no. So I, I put up here on the screen because a lot of the audience is watching on Twitter right now. Yeah. And they may not know where to find these previous 12 episodes. So I wanted to make sure that, that they knew that the, the stuff that you and I have been doing here for the last 12 weeks on uh, Saturday mornings here is youtube.com slash at the mic with Keith. And then after you've caught up with that playlist, go and see the, 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 the future stuff that, that uh, Ed's going to be working on over at rediscovering Walt Disney Dot com. Uh, Ed, I mean, it's just been such an education uh, over the last four months, and I appreciate your time. And and I hope people understand the amount of time because 
Ed and I don't just <laughs> sit up. I mean, okay, let me back up. I sit down here on Saturday morning and I hang out for a couple of hours with Ed and all of you. And I'm so grateful for it. Ed put so much time and effort researching yeah. all of this stuff, <laughs> organizing all of this stuff, mostly organizing, getting the, getting the images scanned and delivered to me. Thousands of images that we've done here in, in, in shown over the last several months that takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. And I Ed, figured it, it out one week. So you, <laughs> 80 hour weeks, <laughs> oh, brother, you but have put for, so much. These are forever. So I wanted to have a resource here. Cause that's like why, why we did the show with all the live action films. So people know what's out there and yes. they can go look for them and things. And I just happened to grab. Oh no, 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 that no, no, this internet signal has held for. Oh, 12 weeks and then we get in the last moments ed okay ed, we're back okay we're back that now. was probably the disney woke disney after me right. this is a, if you want to book on disneyland this came out the year uh roy passed away so it's okay. the last one that's probably not woke mm. and it's disneyland then now and forever and what year did that and come out two, i think 2009 roy jr okay Very that was good. the year roy jr died but it's it's got it shows how some of the rides are built. It's like a little, it's like a yearbook, but it's about the theme park. Awesome. And I, I meant to uh, mention that I didn't put that in the photos, but because uh, okay. people are always asking me what books to get, and I've got so many Disney books. How many do you think you have? Any idea? I've got to have close to six hundred or eight hundred or something like that. Just Disney. Bro. I mean, just with American history and folklore, I've have at least two thousand. So. <laughs> uh. It's You're I told, it's like the library of Alexandra Drea here. <laughs> that's right. Drea. That's right. Okay, so just to recap, look for the uh, uh, Saving Disney History playlist over at youtubecom slash at the mic with Keith. Keep an eye on RediscoveringWaltDisney.com for stuff that Ed will uh, share going forward. Ed, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, not only uh, just learning from you and just getting to know you, and I appreciate all of the effort and time that you've put into this. And I know everybody watching. Uh, is so grateful as well, man. Thank you. All righty. Well, I guess. We, oh, see, what is with the internet? The, the, come on now. I Let's, can hear you. There. Oh, there we go. Hold on. Say it again. Say I goodbye. can hear you. <laughs> I can hear you. Goodbye. That's we're yeah, being interfered so. with the with the demon right? of wokeness. <laughs> demon of wokeness. All right, everyone. Have a great weekend. Thanks so much for spending time. We're so grateful. Take care.